The hour of 1045 having arrived, the Santa Cruz City Council meeting is called to order and the clerk will call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Council Member Newsom? Present. Brown? Here. Watkin? Here. Bruner? Present. Palantari Johnson? Present. Vice Mayor Golder? Here. And Mayor Keeley? Here. A quorum having been established, we will move to Recording in progress. Public Excuse me? It was the Zoom. Okay. <laughs> uh, we will move the item regarding the City Council's closed session. This will be the opportunity for anyone who is with us today, either in chambers or on the phone, who would like to comment on any of the items as published in our agenda relative to closed session. Let me ask if there's anyone first who are in chambers with us today. I see in here no one uh, wants to comment on this. Ms. Bush, do we have anyone online? We do not, no. We do not. Right. The uh, items that will be discussed in closed session are on the closed session portion of the public agenda. What we will do at this point is we will adjourn this meeting of the Santa Cruz City Council into closed session. We will return uh, upon our work in closed session, we will be here either at 1230 uh, or as soon thereafter as we finish our closed session. At this point, we stand adjourned into closed session. The hour of 12.30 having arrived, the City Council is back in session following our closed session uh, earlier in the day. Uh, we are on item number three on our agenda today. I could just take a, roll, Mayor, sorry. Oh, excuse yeah. me. <laughs> in our regular session, the clerk will call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Council Member Newsom? Present. Brown? Here. Watkins? Here. Bruner? Present. Palantari Johnson? Present. Vice Mayor Golder? Here. And Mayor Keeley? Here. Quorum having been established, we will proceed to item number three. This is a mayoral proclamation declaring June 27th as LGBTQIA plus Youth and Allies Leadership Day in the city of Santa Cruz. And it is a pleasure every year in this welcoming, wonderful community of ours to welcome that community into our presence here in City Hall and to give you a proclamation and thank you for your courage and your presence in our community. It is indeed uh, a privilege that you have the courage to stand up, be yourself, and uh, it's our privilege uh, to honor you in that regard. I'm going to come down and hand you this proclamation and I would like to invite you to make comments uh, once I have done that. So Mayor Keeley and city council members, I know some of you, and uh, my name is Stuart Rosenstein. I am the chair of the Queer Youth Task Force and co-chair of the Queer Youth Leadership Awards that now in its 26th year. Um, as some of you might know, the Queer Youth Leadership Awards is now in its 26th year. It started here in Santa Cruz at a little restaurant called Hobie's. It doesn't exist anymore. And uh, we've been honoring and celebrating queer youth leaders and their allies uh, all these years, and it's become a really beautiful event. Many of you are there and attend, and um, it's just really important that in Santa Cruz, in the city of Santa Cruz, a proclamation like this that's quite beautiful and very lovely and very important, it sends a wonderful message to our youth leaders. It sends an important message to the teachers, to the GSA and the Saga advisors in the middle schools and in the high schools and now in the elementary schools. It also sends a really important message to parents and guardians. So this is really important and very beautiful. 
and just very thankful. We have some of the people who were involved with the Creative Leadership Awards here. Uh, Brian, who's a UCSC intern, who is one of our assistant coordinators. And then we have two students, one of them a nominee, one of them an awardee, and they would like to say a few words. Again, thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. Welcome, good afternoon. Good afternoon, thank you for having us. Um, I'm Brian Hannaway, he, him. Um, I'm a recent UCSC graduate, and I've been working with Stuart for about, I think, six months now in the Creative Task Force, and um, it's just been an honor to be a part of QILA. I think that the work that they're doing to really bring um, youth that put effort into advocating for themselves, for their peers, for their families in the spotlight of Santa Cruz is really important, and it's amazing to see them get the recognition that they deserve, as well as QILA for the um, proclamation that you've given us today. And so yeah, I just want to say thank you so much for having us. And I think that this shows that Santa Cruz really is an amazing place to live. Thank you so much. Please. Good afternoon. Hi, my name's Luca Brown. I am 17. I use he, him, and they, them pronouns. I'm homeschooled, and I do a lot of my advocacy work in city of Santa Cruz. I'm incredibly grateful to have been a nominee for the Career Youth Leadership Awards, and I'm incredibly grateful that we as queer people have this outlet, and we are recognized and validated in this community. And I'm incredibly grateful of all the fighting that everyone, including allies, does for us, especially considering the current climate in this country and how trans people like me are um, treated and what we are faced with. Um, I want to, I want us to be given the visibility to highlight our oppression and the things that we face. And this applies not only to officials, but also the average citizen in their household. Uh, centrality is neutrality in the face of marginalization, and you have the power to oppose what queer people are faced with every day. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Aiden Parton. I am uh, 13 years old. I'm going into eighth grade at Branson Forty Middle School. Um, I work with um, youth at the um, uh, downtown Santa Cruz Boys and Girls Club. Um, I volunteer. I also am the um, president or co-president of um, the Musca Queers at my school, which is our GSA. Um, and it's been such an honor to work with all the amazing people to make that made this um, a thing, and it's just really cool to see the recognition that um, to give uh, queer youth um, the recognition to um, for the work that um, we've been doing. And I just want to thank everybody and thank Stuart. Um, it's been really amazing to work with him. Uh, thank you. Well, thank you so much, sir. I just want to end with the name Terry Cavanaugh, who founded the Queer Youth Leadership Awards in 1998. He is from Santa Cruz, now lives up in Oregon. And I think he would be proud of what the city is doing. I also want to highlight the rainbow flag and the trans flag that you have here. I thought they were outside, and I'm sure they are, but I didn't know they were sitting behind you. And that's really touching to me, a middle-aged gay man that didn't come out into his 30s. I just want to thank you very much. Thank you. Well, thank you, all of you, so much for being here and the fine work that you do in the community on justice and civil rights. Thank you very, very much for being here today. Questions or comments? Question, any comments? Anybody want to make a quick comment on this? No, we're good. We're all just so happy to see you here. So good. On item number four, this is a mayoral proclamation declaring July as Parks and Recreation Month. And unsurprisingly, we have Mr. Elliott here <laughs> <laughs> to present on this issue. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Thank you very much, Mayor Keeley and City Council members. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here. Very grateful for the opportunity uh, to kick off uh, July as Parks and Recreation Month. 
so with me are a couple Parks and Rec staff here, as well as our Parks and Recreation Commission Chair, Christina Glavis, uh, and our Vice Chair, Holly Locatelli, is back here uh, as well. So um, I just want to mention you all look great in your hats. We've got a, lo a lot of work to do out in the parks. Ah, yes. Uh, so we would welcome you guys to get involved in the field with us after the, the presentation uh, today at some point. But appreciate the time very much. I'd like to hand it over to our Commission Chair, Christina Glavis, to share a few remarks, and then our Recreation Superintendent, Tremaine Head and jones to share some remarks as well. So thank you. The Chair of the Parks and Recreation Commission is recognized. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you for having us. Um, each year since 1985, Americans have celebrated Park and Recreation Month during the month of July to recognize the importance of parks and recreation in establishing and maintaining the quality of life for and contributing to the physical, economic, and environmental well-being of communities. Through efforts led by the National Recreation and Park Association, the U.S. House of Representatives passed an official resolution for Park and Recreation Month in 2009. This year, the National Recreation and Park Association theme for Parks and Recreation Month is Where Community Grows in recognition of the vital role parks and recreation professionals play in bringing people together, providing essential services, and fostering growth of communities. And now on to Trey. Thank you. Commissioner Good Glavis. Afternoon, thank sir. you. Uh, council, uh, excuse me, can you, uh, thank you. So I'm gonna conduct an, an informal poll with council right now. Um, how many of you have been to a park within the last 30 days? Raise your hand. Keep your hands up. How many have been to a park within the last week? How many have been to a park within the last day? And how many have been in a park in the last hour? Well, technically <laughs> that last one was a trick question because technically City Hall is a park. Oh, so you have all passed. Okay. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, technology. Do we have to turn it on? Okay. Oh, no. There we go. Okay. There we go. So this ties into um, our mission, which is to build a healthy community, to foster equity, and to better the environment. Visiting parks are part of that value, and we have and hold in the community. Next slide, please. The services that parks and recreation professionals provide is vital for our healthy community and well-being, from protecting open spaces and natural resources to providing activities and resources for all. Parks and Recreation Month encourages everyone to re reflect on the exceptional value and parks and recreation professionals bring to our varied communities. Next slide, please. For this Parks and Recreation Month, we encourage the community to visit SantaCruzParksandRec.com to find ways to participate and explore this month's activities. A few highlights we want to share are the Tuesday Night Live concert series at the Wharf on July 11th, the Teen Glow in the Dark Beach Party on July 14th, and the wildly popular tree walk with our urban forester, Leslie Keedy, on July 29th. We hope to see you in the parks. So the last slide here, sorry, one more. This month, our challenge to the City Council and to the community is to snap photos of your Parks and Recreation adventures, post them to Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, whatever your socials are, and use these hashtags, hashtag July is Parks and Rec Month, and hashtag where community grows. To officially kick off the 2023 Parks and Recreation Month, we've shared with you some goodies in your swag bag, which you guys are all <laughs> representing right now, thank you. Um, and we also ask that the uh, council and the mayor, um, if we can approach the dais to take a photo, and we'll post this to our social media as well. Other presentations? Further presentations? We're good? That's it. Well, thank you very much for being here. We will uh, we'll do what you've asked here. Awesome. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Mayor. In just a moment. And when I do that, I'll, uh, when we walk down there, we'll I'll hand you, Madam Chair, uh, the proclamation from the city and thank you all so very much we I think uh, I think I speak for the council in saying that 
in the city of Santa Cruz with not only our 66,000 residents, but the 100,000 people that come over eight months of the year who come over here to enjoy uh, our city, a very big part of it is the wonderful, welcoming, well-maintained, seriously staffed by wonderfully competent people, our park system. And we are so grateful to you. It is one of the parts of our city that we take pride in, not the sin of pride, but the pride of a job well done. We know that we can and should do more on this, and we will as time moves along, but thank you so much for the great work that you do that makes life in this community greener, happier, and more fun every day. Thank you for that. Let's talk about yeah. that. They're coming up here. Bring them up. Come on up here. There we go. Thank you, Bonnie. Ready? Yeah. All Thanks. good? All right. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that, but while we are still on this item, I'd like to recognize Council Member Watkins. I just wanted to, before the parks team leaves, I just wanted to say thanks to also the folks who couldn't make it because they're at the Junior Guards competition. <laughs> and I saw DC this morning and he was like, this is the first one I'm missing. So a shout out to those folks in addition to the entire team. So anyways, thank you. Thank you all. Yeah. Thank you. Good point. All right. Uh, we are on item four. Uh, I do not have announcements uh, to make at this point. Statements of disqualification. Any member have a statement of disqualification? Ms. Bruner. Um, let's see. Item number 29 as it relates to my employment. Okay. Other statements of disqualification? All right, seen and hearing none. Deletions and deletions to the consent agenda. Let me see if, uh, Ms. Bush, we do have. Thank you, Mayor. Not to the consent agenda, but item 30, which is the David Way appeal. The appellant has emailed us to let, them know, let us know that they are withdrawing their appeal. So it will be removed. <coughs> I want to make sure, since this is noticed on our agenda and the appellant has withdrawn, we need take no action of any kind. It is simply has disappeared off of our agenda. Okay, so if you were here or someone who is online was here on that, uh, wants to comment on the item, the item has been removed at the request of the appellant. Let me... Uh, those of you unfamiliar with our consent agenda, the consent agenda is a group of items, items 6 through 27, uh, that are all uh, going to be acted on upon one vote. And so you're going to have an opportunity to comment or pull such items. Ms. Bush? Thank you. Sorry. We just need to let the city attorney give his report out. Yes. Mr. City Attorney. Thank you, Mayor Keeley, members of the City Council. <clears throat> there are several real property negotiation items on uh, this morning's closed session agenda. Uh, item one was the city-owned property of approximately 8.15 acres 
uh, located on Mount Hermon Road in Scotts Valley. The parties uh, are the City of Santa Cruz and the City of Scotts Valley. Item two is the city-owned property at 333 Front Street here in Santa Cruz. Negotiating parties, the city and the Homeless Garden Project. Under negotiations, the price in terms of payment for a potential lease. Item three is property located in unincorporated Santa Cruz County uh, along Firehouse Lane. Owners are Seashore, a partnership, Robert R. Rittenhouse and Edith Ann Rittenhouse, and Denoyer F. O'Laughlin and Nancy T. O'Laughlin. Uh, negotiating parties are the city of Santa Cruz um, and, the, and the property owners just mentioned. Um, item four is real property at 6000 La Madrona Drive, Scotts Valley. Uh, owner of that property is Scotts Valley Fire Protection District. City is negotiating um, terms of purchase of an easement and a temporary construction easement on that property. Item five is real property on Sims Road at 175 Sims Road. Owners Craig Yates and Nicole Yates, uh, co-trustees. Again, city's negotiating potential price in terms of payment of, a, uh, of an easement. Last item on the uh, closed session agenda was pending litigation. Two items of litigation, case entitled City of Santa Cruz versus the Regents of the University of California et al. Currently pending in the Santa Cruz County Superior Court. Uh, second item, Regents of the University of California et al. versus the City of Santa Cruz. Currently uh, pending in the 6th Appellate District Court of Appeal. Uh, there was no re reportable action on any of those items. Thank you, sir. Madam Clerk, anything on the council calendar? No, nothing. Thank you. Items 6 through 27 inclusive are the items on our consent calendar today. Let me ask if there are uh, items that council members would like to either pull or comment on. We'll start on my left. Ms. Bruner? Comment on 14. Yes. Question on 16. Uh, that was it. 14 and 16. These are both comments, correct? 14 and 16. One comment, one question. Okay, got it. Uh, comment on 23. 23, comment 23. I miss Contar Johnson. Madam Vice Mayor? Yep. Good. Ms. Watkins, Ms. Brown? I'd like to pull item 9, and I have a comment on item 22 and a question on 20, which I've received an answer to, but I just want to make sure that the folks in the public who asked got an answer. So I, okay, I'll I ask wanna, that question. I want to make sure then uh, we do that one more time for me. So, okay, just polling nine, polling nine and then a question on 20 and a comment on 22. Very good. And uh, Mr. Newsom, okay. All right, let's start back through this on uh, questions and comments. Uh, let me go to Ms. Bruner. Let's start with 14. Uh, 14, let's see, this is First Amendment to uh, Graffiti Abatement Services Agreement with Graffiti Protective Coatings, Inc., under Economic Development Department. And um, this is um, an item to authorize a continued agreement with the Graffiti, graffiti Protective Coatings, Inc. for graffiti abatement throughout uh, the city. And one of the main ways that the public and um, we can report graffiti is through our city CRISP app, the Community Request for Service Portal. And I just want to... Uh, my comment is that um, the graffiti protective coatings um, have done an excellent job, and I'm really happy to see this continued agreement. Um, their response is quick and timely. They remove um, very large graffiti tags on private and public uh, buildings and uh, infrastructure, and um, I just want to say thank you. Ms. Brunner, uh, on 16? 
2016, uh, an award contract for safety footwear. Um, this item is to award a contract for citywide purchases for safety footwear to Beck Shoes, Inc., Campbell, California, for a three-year term. Um, and then my question on this, uh, let's see, who would I ask? Uh, city manager? It's under city... It's finance. I can answer, or Elizabeth Milway is also on, okay. and she could answer. Thank you. Um, my question, I just, um, in the agenda packet, the, I'm just curious the, if there were other um, bids, other options within the city of Santa Cruz in order to support a local business and to keep that tax revenue here in the city. That's a really good question. Thank you, uh, Elizabeth Milwee, a Purchasing Manager, Finance Department. Uh, thank you, Mayor and Council, for the question. Um, so in this scenario, we are utilizing uh, the Muni Code that allows us to um, piggyback using a cooperative purchasing mechanism, um, which is allowed for in our municipal code. Um, BEX is, although we are utilizing a contract that was bid out through Santa Clara County, there is a local Beck store that we will be utilizing to procure the safety footwear if uh, an employee chooses that option. This is one of two contracts for safety shoes. Both are locally procured. One is at the Beck store um, in Capitola, and the other is um, the Red Wing uh, boot contract that we have in place. So both are local businesses. Is that the Red Wing on Soquel Avenue in Santa Cruz? It is. Okay, thank you. Thank you. That answers my question. Thank you. Council Member Kalantari Johnson on item 23. Thank you, yes, this is the Westcliff Drive Stabilization Project. I just wanted to acknowledge and thank uh, Public Works and uh, the entire team for the tremendous amount of work you've done to get us here. Um, I know this had to be expedited because of funding um, restrictions, so just want to acknowledge and thank you for your work. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Brown, how about we go to item 20 where you had a comment? Got it. So actually question on 20, and I wanna thank Lee Butler and Matt Starkey for getting back to me on this question, uh, which was related to, this is the um, contract amendment with Emily Horn for downtown expansion planning work. And so some folks in the community are wondering and concerned about the traffic study portion in particular um, and the fact that we use weekday. Uh, peak, we do use peak uh, morning and evening or afternoon uh, for weekdays but are, do not include weekend traffic. And given the location, it feels where there is an in, a major influx of weekend traffic. Um, it, want to know why we're not looking at that. Thanks. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Matt Starkey, Transportation Manager. Um, so our traffic study guidelines is where we get <clears throat> the requirements for these, um, these applications that come in for development. And we choose the weekday afternoon peak hour because that comes from our general plan. In our general plan, we an analyze these different trips uh, and we evaluate that growth um, as we uh, increase development in the city. So those differences we are looking at as we increase growth are only calibrated to the uh, weekday afternoon. Uh, a challenge with doing Saturday is that it's, um, as we all know, trying to get to the beach on beautiful Saturdays in Santa Cruz is very challenging. And those weekends represent only a very small portion of the traffic that we experience out there. So if we were to then analyze and design our roadways for these very uh, small portions of the year, we might end up with results on our roadways that we didn't, wouldn't want to live with for the rest of the year. Uh, so for that, that big picture thinking and our um, requirements from the general plan is why we stay with the afternoon peak hour requirement here. Thank you. And if I could just follow up, uh, it sounded like in the response that I received, thinking about other road-related infrastructure, transportation infrastructure, so bike lanes, pedestrian paths, and if we the roads are widened for cars, then that limits the space for other amenities as well. Yeah, exactly. That's the challenge we start to get if we tried to solve a vehicle problem on the uh, most heavily used days. 
we'd end up with, you know, Highway 17 going right to the beach. And I don't think we'd want to <clears throat> necessarily live on those, those roadways. And so that's the challenge we get at there. Um, it's good to note in the scope that we, we have heard this concern and there are some other items we're looking at. Um, for example, um, the Laurel Street Extension Road, which goes from front over to third. Uh, we're looking at um, some access management there so that we could potentially in the summer have um, residential access, emergency access, bus access to help alleviate some of that congestion people are concerned about. And also in the scope, we'll be working at transportation demand management strategies will help reduce the amount of traffic um, caused by the development. Thank you. I, I appreciate that and appreciate the efforts to address some of that. I'm looking at uh, the, those choke points, uh, particularly around emergency services and emergency response. It feels like um, people want to know that they can be accessed. Thanks. Thank you. Ms. Brown on 22. Thank you. So I, I just want to make a comment on number 22. This is the permit fees for the oversized vehicle ordinance. Um, I will, I want to register no vote on this one when the time comes, but I just want to say uh, I notice here that once again we see no communication with the stakeholder group that was uh, intended to be part of the process of developing and operationalizing this um, pilot uh, coastal permit. So um, just making a, a note that uh, there are folks who want to be involved in this conversation and have been uh, kind of uh, designated to, be, to do that, and they're not hearing from the city when decisions are being made. So um, I hope that we can do better with that aspect of this pilot project. Thank you. Uh, on item 20, if I could uh, ask Mr. Butler on this item, sir, I'm, I'm sorry. Yes, Mr. Butler, if I could ask you, I thank you for responding to the council's previous discussion regarding increasing the number of community meetings that will take place through this process. So from here forward, uh, there will be how many noticed comprehensive public meetings? So we're looking at a, a number of approaches at engaging the community um, with uh, large community meetings, one of those approaches. Um, Two uh, community meetings are anticipated. We're also expecting focus group meetings as well as uh, online engagement and survey work. And that's an increase over previous of, of two additional, is that correct? I believe it's one additional. One additional? Yes, one additional so meeting. One additional. And I would imagine as we move through time on this, if it's determined that additional public outreach, public meetings, whatever it might be, we could take additional action here, working with you and the city manager, uh, if we wanted to say, well, they're based on circumstances as we're moving through this very significant planning effort that we say, gee, here's, here's one here we didn't anticipate back in the end of June of 2022. Here's, here's something as we're in you know, February or March of 2023. We say here's something else. We, we have the ability to amend the contract, work with you, work with others to have additional meetings if we think that's, if the council thinks in, uh, that that's the appropriate thing to do. We are not, in other words, we're not limited to this number except to the degree we're signing a contract. That's correct. We've added uh, additional monies for public outreach, not only that one um, larger community meeting, but also the focus groups and assistance with the survey. And um, the earlier versions of the contract did include flexibility in that outreach as needed. I'm just going to confirm that that flexibility is still, yes, I'm, I'm getting a thumbs up from the team. That flexibility is still in the contract so that um, we can tailor that engagement as we need as we go forward. I'll give you a wild guess right now. We're going to be talking about more Steinberg's so on. That'd be my wild guess on this. Thank you for your response on that. Of I would like to pull item 10. We are on item uh, the, this. Uh, let me ask the public first of all. Anyone with us today wish to comment on any item on our consent agenda? 
And do we have folks online as well? What we'll do on this, because we have folks online, is first we'll take someone from who's with us here, then we'll go online, then we'll go someone here, we'll, we'll toggle back and forth. Good afternoon. Afternoon. My name is Kevin Hewlin. I'm uh, the manager of um, Card Room downtown, south of Laurel on Pacific Avenue. Um, we are one of roughly 75 active licenses in the entire state, um, card room gaming licenses, overseen primarily by the California Department of Justice. Um, we've been in business at this location for over 20 years, uh, quietly. Um, recently moving into wanting to engage with the city more. And so one of the items on the consent agenda, I've been working with the city, and um, I just wanted to introduce myself but also voice my appreciation for the work the city has done on this resolution. Mm. Um, although it's not exactly what we were asking for, it's a, um, it's a beginning. And so I'm grateful. And, um, I'd like to continue the dialogue, so appreciate your time. Before you leave the dais, and that is on item seven. Thank you very much. Yes. Make sure we tied those together okay. for you. Thank you for, your, for being here this afternoon and your kind words. We'll go online. First person online, we are good to go with you. Okay, yeah, hi, this is Garrett. Hey, I will comment on item number nine later when it comes up by itself, but um, could you comment further on item 11 as to how $4 million to operate 135 homeless tents as shelter spaces amounting to a minimum, if run at capacity, of $30,000 per homeless tent per year as to how is that a value proposition? That's about what a minimum wage person earns working 50 weeks a year. Consider if that service was provided to every person in Santa Cruz, it would cost $1.8 billion in simple math, 30,000 times 62,000. Uh, a bit more detail on how many people, at what salaries, at what duties are involved and what the actual cost is for these services. Especially, it should be compared to some result goal, you know, in order before swallowing this costly bill. Um, I would comment on item 15, that adjusting the spending limits to the maximum allowable expense limit allowed by law seems typical of the mindset I see every two weeks. And um, I get in trouble here, but uh, I'm going to take some liberty here, and I'm going to assert that no living person is an LBGTQIA plus person. That is a fictitious, made-up leftist group identity of an amalgamation of very different people with very different ideas and different opinions about a great many things, some wishing to transfer the legitimacy of some issues to very different other ones, some of which I'd say violates other people's individual rights. Thanks. Thank you. Next person who's with us. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mayor Council members. Gillian Greenside. I'd like to comment on item 20. I listened carefully to the traffic engineer, and it doesn't answer the concerns, not just of myself, but probably most people who live on the Lower West Side. The rationale for limiting the traffic study to the weekdays, if I heard it correctly, was that uh, the weekends are just a small percentage and we don't want to plan our roads um, for what's not the most usual usage. Well, anyone who lives near this area knows that this is not commuter traffic uh, route. People go up to Mission for that. Uh, and that the impact on the weekends is dramatic. And I'm assuming, I may be incorrect here, but I'm assuming this information gathered will also be used for your CEQA environmental review. Uh, if that's accurate, uh, that statement I just made, then this is woefully inadequate. You're supposed to be studying the environmental impacts of the quite massive development that will be in this, what is it, 13 square acres. Uh, that's... that's People will be outraged when they hear that you are studying traffic just on the weekdays for an area which is jammed now with beach-going, 
boardwalk going traffic on weekends. That has to be studied so you can mitigate it. There are mitigations possible, but to just avoid it and, and the, with the ra that rationale, I think, you know, it's not going to sit well. It's not going to give you the information you need and the community needs to mitigate the impacts of possibly 3,000 new residents in this small area. I, er, I know the state law has changed in terms of you only have to look at vehicle miles travelled, not congestion. However, if you read that carefully, you will see that site-specific vari variations and studies can occur if there's a site-specific reason to look at congestion. And I would say that anyone who's been here for a while and knows that area knows that that is what we will be facing. It's, it's uh, incumbent on you to have the traffic studied on weekends now and then extrapolate 3,000 more people with or without cars and the impact of that. I hope you will make an amendment to that study. Thank you. Thank you. Next person online, and we will, Ms. Bush, you'll tell me when they're ready. Ready to go? Good. Person online, good afternoon. Uh, members of the community and city council. Um, oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Norse, just, just a moment. We're going to alternate back and forth, so we're going to take somebody oh, online. I'm sorry. Then we'll be, no, it's quite all right. So, person online, good afternoon. Uh, hi, this is Reggie Meister. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, Mr. Meisler. Good afternoon. Thank you. Um, I think I just want to comment a little bit on the Overlook Emergency Shelter contract. Uh, I appreciate that you guys are trying to keep that open and you're trying to use the remaining funds to like keep those folks stable. I do think, though, that like if you just do a quick check on the math for this, like uh, Blue's trailer, right? Blue from Downtown Streets team cost about $18,000. If you gave every single person in the emergency shelter a detached trailer, it would cost $2.4 million. So like half the price of keeping the shelter open, they would have basically permanent shelter that would be an improvement over what they have now. And we could use the remaining money uh, you know, on things like the pallet shelters at Housing Matters. And I just feel like this need to, like, police and criminalize people, like the OVO does uh, with its criminalization of detached trailers, or how the Armory Shelter <laughs> spends so much money just kind of keeping people out of sight and uh, containing their poverty. It's just, it's a huge amount of money wasted um, when if we just kind of were a little more creative and a little more trusting, uh, we could accomplish so much more with the amount of money we have. Uh, and so I just want to sort of bring that kind of thinking to you, uh, cause I know that like as city staff brings these ideas forward as community groups like Santa Cruz neighbors who have a large voice, uh, speak up, it often feels like creativity is incredibly limited. And then the only things we're allowed to do is criminalize people, spend huge amounts of money on things that like don't work uh, for a very long amount of time, like spending hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, to give people temporary shelter for like a few months when we could just give them some kind of permanent detached trailer or vehicle, like a converted van. And uh, and we could spend money on outreach, getting uh, neighborhoods bought in to a letting people park in their neighborhood, building relationships between the people in vehicles and the people in uh, housed areas, instead of just this constant uh, apartheid type thinking and separation. And Lisa Murphy herself said there is no housing available at a recent budget meeting. So. Why are we wasting so much money continually on these temporary uh, springboard sort of plans that rely on caseworkers to get people into housing? Because we know that that's not a thing. So 
just I I urge you to think like critically about these kinds of plans because ultimately it's going to be like people are just going to complain to you later anyways. So, thanks. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon, sir. So I'm going to try to invoke the progressive promise of one of the council members, Sandy Brown, that the public be allowed to hear from the staff and community on an item that was traditionally the case for years before the muzzle, as I see it, was imposed. So I'm only going to ask that items 11, 12, and 22 be removed for brief comment by the public and perhaps any staff questions that members of the council and the, the community may have. Items 11, 12, and 22, and if I could say, uh, uh, in my own case, I made an error when I said that I'd like to continue item 10. I meant item 11 uh, to pull it onto uh, uh, for further discussion. So we will take items 11, 12, 22, and 9 will uh, not be part of our vote here. We will, let me see if there are other comments, folks online, Ms. Bush, do we still have other folks? No, anyone else? present in chambers today who wishes to have an item continued, or, or excuse me, uh, pulled. Seeing hearing none, the motion would be in order to approve the consent agenda as amended. I'll approve the consent agenda with the exceptions of items 9, 11, 12, and 22. Such is the motion. Is there a second? I'll second. Second by Council Member Newsom. Debate or discussion? Ms. Bruner, under discussion. <laughs> I just had a question um, in response to one of the public comments on the traffic study on weekends and what that would entail to include that versus not including that. Okay, we have a staff member approaching on that. Good afternoon, sir. Hi, good afternoon, Matt Starkey again, transportation manager. <clears throat> Um, adding weekends would be uh, very expensive. I think that's one of the one of the items here is we're looking to uh, control the cost that we as the city are spending on this study. Um, we're under the cost center, so we're thinking that that would be um, I don't know. It's a higher order of magnitude cost that would change uh, change the study, so we're not putting it in. Council member, which item is that community? Uh, this is item number 20, I believe. Is it? Am I on the right? 20. Yeah. I'm going to, what I'm going to do, I, this is going to engage us in further conversation. I'm going to pull that item if that's all right. Okay. I'll just take it out of this. We'll, we'll get back to you. All right. Minus item 12, we're, uh, excuse me, item 20, and the other items that have previously been included in the motion for continuation, uh, motion on the remainder of the consent agenda for their debate or discussion. Seeing hearing none, the clerk will call the roll. Councilmember Newsom? Aye. Brown? Aye. Is 22 pulled? Yes. Okay. Um, Watkins? Aye. Bruner? Aye. Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. Mayor Keeley? Aye. Consent is amended as approved. We will start with uh, item nine, Ms. Brown. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> so this item is an update to our council policies. And um, so I, I want to start out by saying that I am not asking these questions or uh, making these comments uh, to suggest that the work that was done here in uh, for the purpose of kind of uh, making our policies consistent across different documents and um, kind of clean up related to state law all that work was um, I absolutely appreciate it and I'm not <laughs> being critical of that but it did uh, what this did cause me to do was take you know relook at our uh, council policies and the handbook attached um, and in particular I have some questions um, mostly for my colleagues really about um, you know ba about balance what I see as balancing concerns or an, an interest in uh, making meetings more efficient 
and uh, you know, and getting through meetings more quickly so that we are doing the business here. Um, but a lot of the other work gets done outside of the meetings. I, I recognize that as a goal, and it's uh, it's a laudable one and one I share. And I think we should be balancing um, those efficiency concerns with access for the public. And so I just wanted to ask about a few of these. Um, <clears throat> and so in particular, related to policy 6.5 and 6.6, .6, which the purpose of this is to align with our council handbook. This is related to uh, oral communications in particular. I know this has been uh, an item of considerable contention on this council during my time on the council. And, um, you know, we, we've had, we've kind of swung, we've had wild swings in terms of how um, count the particular councils want this to be addressed. Um, and right now, and, and I, I'm, I don't have a strong opinion on exactly when it is, um, because there's always going to be a challenge, whatever time of the day. People don't like seven because it's family dinner time. People don't like five because they're still getting off work. People don't like during the day um, because they're at work. However, <clears throat> having a, an indeterminate start time, I think, I mean, I, I would hope uh, we could see is problematic in and of itself. And so I'd like to see us try to find a way to get to some kind of time where people know they can come and address the council on items not on our agenda without having to wait all day and then maybe have to come back for the evening session. Um, or, you know, I mean, I know we can do it online now, but it just, it's very difficult. And I hear from so many people who say, well, I was there and I waited and I tried, or I came back and it was over. And so I just feel like it would be, it would be really great to find a way to do something about that. And so I'm asking my colleagues if you might consider uh, ha doing something differently. And and one of the, and I'm just putting this out here and and as an idea, I'd like to have kind of worked this through in advance, but can't do that with the Brown Act, and it just came to our agenda. So um, could we think about having the beginning of the open session? be open for oral communications for a, a certain amount of time, um, short amount of time, and so people could come and just get that done. The Board of Supervisors does this, and they let people come at the beginning of the meeting, speak to any item on the agenda, and then they can leave, and they don't end up having, they're not stuck unless they want to be and be really involved in the, dis, you know, here for the discussion. So I just, I don't know that we can make that change today, but rather than making it, uh, you know, codifying that it's going to be, um, at the end of the session or at the beginning of the evening session, um, could we talk about some kind of set time? And if, it's, if there's too much oral communications, we could always return and people would have to wait. But it, would just, it just feels like this makes it completely inaccessible to people. They have no idea when it's going to be. So um, that's a question I have for you all. Mm -hmm. I wanted to ask about before we deliberate. Thank you, Council Member. Ms. Watkins on this item. No, I, I appreciate you bringing that up, uh, Councilmember Brown. Having been through a lot of these back and forth discussions around oral communications, um, yes, it has been a contentious often point um, within our policy. I just want to make sure I'm really understanding what you're suggesting. And so if, if I'm hearing you correctly, what I hear you say is that you're suggesting we open at the beginning of the meeting for oral communications and for an opportunity for individuals to speak on items on the agenda. Is that correct? Well, I just brought that up because it's the way the board does it. I don't have a strong feeling about that, but um, it could be nice if people want to consider it. Again, I don't know that we can really open that up as a conversation here because it's not on our agenda as a recommendation. Okay. But if people are interested, perhaps we could just look at that. direct that we not make the change on this policy this time and that we direct uh, to come back with a recommend or some kind of report on starting at the beginning of the yeah, best practice. Really, it's just having some definitive time certain is would be great. And when it comes to our regular items, that's not what we're talking about here. But it occurred to me that it also could be really helpful for people who want to come and speak 
on an item. I'm, so, yeah. again, I'm no, open. I appreciate that. I'm open to that. I think, you know, I, I look to the mayor having sat in that chair. I know it's also a balance of how you're planning the agendas, so having that certainty might be helpful. Um, I think that having Zoom as an option has definitely changed the way that we can hear from the community, um, particularly individuals who aren't able to make it to chambers or don't feel safe and comfortable, which has often been things that I've heard in terms of some contentious items that have come before mm -hmm. us. So all that to say is I am supportive of potentially mm -hmm. having, and I think the mayor should sit within the room or uh, the committee or with our city staff on what that looks like in terms of st structuring that because sure. um, I know it goes hand in hand but I, I appreciate the suggestion and I'm open to that personally vice mayor is recognized and Ms. Bruner I know the mayor and I have been talking and my thought is that we should start moving away from using zoom and I don't agree on that necessarily at this point but to that end, I think having a time certain, or at least if it's the beginning of the afternoon session where it's like you can look and see what time it begins, then you would know, mm -hmm. even if it did change. And um, I do like how the board does it, where you can speak to any item. I think it would be, in the end, kind of a time saver for us as well and for the public. Ms. Bruner is recognized. Thank you. Um, thank you, Council Member Brown, for um, bringing this, this detail up on this item. Um, so last year, when I was mayor, we did a time certain oral communications, um, and I worked with the city clerk on figuring out how that would be with the agenda, and that way there was always a time posted of when oral communications was. Um, I think, you know, Zoom did help or the, the online attendance helps people to be able to attend no matter what time it is. Um, I think having time certain is more beneficial than not. And whether it's at the beginning of the meeting, as you say, the County Board of Supervisors does it, or at any time certain on the agenda, um, I think it's... Um, helpful for uh, the community to have that. Councilmember Colin Tari Johnson. Thank you, yeah, thank you for bringing this up because I've been hearing from the community about this mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. um, I know that this will be probably, it looks like we're moving in the direction of having it be discussed mm -hmm. with the mayor and staff, um, but I'll just put a pitch that I think time certain is, is a good direction. Mm -hmm. um, and what we tried last time when you were mayor was difficult because um, there were sort of interruptions to the flow. So perhaps a way to, to um, solve for that is to do it at the beginning. Yeah. Other comments on this item? Mr. I, Newsom. I just want to uh, uh, briefly thank uh, uh, my colleague, Councilmember Brown, for bringing this up. I've heard a, a good bit about this too, and I think some certainty on when oral communications takes place would be, would be good to look into. Yeah. Further comment on that? Uh, I, I want to make sure, Ms. Brown, if I could ask, ask you this question here. It, I'm not sure if there are one issue or two issues here, so I'm going to make sure I understand this. Uh, with regard to the oral communication, I, absolutely, I think there's a sense of the body right now that you know, we're going to have a further conversation about this with the city manager and city clerk, city attorney, myself, will we'll engage in that. Uh, I want to make sure I understood the, what I thought might be the second portion of what you said. So oral communications, one issue, commenting on items on the agenda when we are not yet at that item. I want to see if you could, I think you want to do something on that as well. I, I think that's a little bit um, more difficult to do, but I want to hear what you want done on that. Thank you. Uh, so I, I, what I really want done primarily is a time certain oral communications time. And w as I thought about how it's handled with other agencies and I see the county meetings, I get to see them in the mornings before we start. Um, and it seems like it works to have that time certain. They also do allow for people to comment on items that are on the agenda. I don't have a strong feeling about that now. Um, I, I just, you know, hopefully you could, perhaps the mayor and vice mayor could talk with staff and come back to us with a proposal for when oral communications time certain might work best okay. and if there are other changes you might 
you talk about it and it seems like it would work, then that, you know, I'm not opposed to doing it that way. I just put it out there kind of. But really what I want to see is oral communication time communication certain. Issue. Okay. Got it. Uh, very helpful. Thank you. Anyone wish to comment on this item? Good afternoon, sir. <laughs> So um, I'm supportive of Councilmember Brown's idea, but I, I, I would go further on this because I looked. I just had a brief look at it, and there's dozens of changes in this document, and many of them may just be uh, insubstantial. But I noticed one particular one, which caught my eye, and I just began to look at it, which is that first preference shall be given to people who didn't speak at the previous meeting. Now, this was the policy of during one or two mayors about 20 years ago. And it was found by the First Amendment Coalition, you can't do this because what it does is it, it makes it more difficult for people who are regular speakers. And it's a way of shoveling, shoveling them to the back, particularly if you're limiting time for oral communication. Now, I mention this not because I'm asking that we change this at this meeting, but I think the public needs more input on the general changes that are being proposed. Sounds like a lot of council members have heard about this one issue, but also um, I would imagine, uh, just having noticed that issue, that there's other issues too that might come up that require some input. And I would even suggest to go into some kind of study session where the public is admitted for uh, some real interchange. Thanks. Thank you. Ms. Bush, do we have anyone online on this item? We'll go to the person online. Good afternoon. Yeah, hello again. Hey, uh, the public would be foolish to comment before the agenda presentations and the discussion that follows unless uh, other people also have the opportunity to speak as it is now. I mean, it's bad enough that things change with friendly amendments and whatever that occur after the public speaks. Uh, and it would only make it worse to speak at the beginning of the meeting to other agenda items. Uh, what item uh, number nine acknowledges is that the council and the city has been operating outside written policy for a long time. Operating outside official policy is technically a violation of policy, like who needs policies? There are 39 such updates are listed here, uh, and some for section six, that the council admittedly for months has changed policy unofficially, but these originated more so by unilateral declarations or a certain loosey goosiness relative to existing written and approved policy rather than presenting proposed policy changes with open public discourse and then a full council approval of them. I, I suppose somebody like the staff has to eventually clean house uh, if nobody else is, but uh, again, how these get started is an issue. And I've noticed several of these unofficial policy changes happening, uh, for instance, allowing a council member to speak at length from their seat during the public's oral communication time instead of perhaps resigning the meeting and coming down to get in line like everybody else and address the council from the public podium, or this elimination of the Pledge of Allegiance to the United States flag, although various other flags seem now to be honored in the chambers, uh, contrast this dismissal of the U.S. flag with the elevation of one representing a baffling movement's support for child mutilation, unhealthy puberty blockers, the destruction of women's sports, bathroom privacy, etc coming from the science denying juvenile gender confused or the mayor offering up a no notice blindside motion sponsoring an end around a two-thirds required vote for an ever-increasing tax for socialized public welfare housing which is a mockery of the very clear rule prohibiting motions by the mayor is oh well we just didn't get around officially changing policy a valid process not really uh on uh, item nine uh, related matter, I'd like to see a policy of listing all resolution documents that passed, uh, including the letters written, similar to the chronological list of ordinances passed by council every year, all in one place on the website, similar to the publication of ordinances link, since they do carry legislative authority. They're very hard to find. Uh, also more consistency is needed in the speaking times allowed, and a better reason to limit oral communications to two minutes than because I could, is needed when so few wish to speak. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon. Nice hat. Yeah, well, the hat is something. Um, yo, yo, uh, what's happening, council members? Could, could have lightened the mood by saying uh, good afternoon, angels. Um, let's see. Um, 
Uh, Zoom is, is amazing. Uh, you know, Zoom, uh, I, 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 I watched uh, last um, uh, week's meeting via Zoom, and, uh, you know, I, I've been to the Zoom headquarters where you can see, like, I don't know, maybe, you know, if it were nighttime, you could see you, everyone here up on the mm -hmm. Zoom building, and that's kind of cool. Um, I guess I, I feel like, you know, for, you know, just civic engagement, it's, it's a wonderful tool. Uh, it's also, eh, it's a little, it's a little off-putting uh, to not really know you know, like Johnny Fe Fever in the uh, WKRP uh, episode, he's like, there are literally hundreds of people listening, and you don't know. You know, like, there's just a pool, the statistics on exactly how many people are are listening in and, you know, even recording um, the comments and, you know, and, and scrutinizing it, analyzing it. Eh, I mean, I don't know. I like going to the boardwalk and, you know, being disoriented and distracted, and that's kind of what Zoom is. Um, anyway, uh, yeah, no, it's... Uh, it's uh, you know I guess there I guess there it might be interesting if there was like some kind of Zoom for government conference where they said you know hey, um, um, you know we should we should limit I guess I feel like they should limit the comments because you it could be endless it could be bottomless how many people could come in and make comments like maybe Zoom should be more of like a, a one minute limit for comments if uh, you don't uh, specifically request for longer time and uh, get it approved ahead of time. Because it's just, yeah, honestly, it could just be kind of endless, and the people are, you know, clearly, you know, very anonymous. Like, you don't see them. You don't know who they are. Garrett Phillips, I'm sure, is a very handsome person. I don't know. Some of the things he said is kind of unusual. Um, anyhow, uh, oh, uh, what else did I have to say? Oh, I have a minute to say it. Uh, uh, yeah, I guess, yeah, if you did have, like, that, as uh, Sandy was suggesting, um, you know, it, it uh, you know, if you had people comment, um, before the meetings, it does kind of steer the meeting, you know, maybe in an odd way. I mean, there are emergent sort of problem problems with doing that, but um, it's, it also seems like kind of kind of sensible, and uh, and it's important that people, um, you know, uh, can access these meetings convenience now that things have changed with the existence of Zoom. Um, I don't think I don't know if the word Zoom existed before, like uh, around 1600 when the telescope and the microscope were invented. Um, just kidding. Anyway, thanks so much for listening to my comments. Thank you, sir. Do we have someone else online, Ms. Bush? Good afternoon. Person online, good afternoon. Let me put that on pause for a second and ask the next person who is uh, with us, uh, please come forward. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Councilmember Brown, for uh, bringing this topic up. And um, I get a feeling that this council is really interested in um, opening it up for the public and much more welcoming to hear from the public than has been true in past some past decades. Um, I really, I and others really appreciate that. It, it does make a big difference. It's thank specific you. to the. Um, issue you're talking about, um, way back when, so Marty Wormhout's time, uh, uh, the council had a, an afternoon session and an evening session. The evening session started at seven and that was oral communications. I don't remember an occasion when the evening session didn't happen. So that was a time certain and that was a structure. That has changed over the years. So my comments are just as you um, discuss this and uh, with staff. My experience when it was time, time certain is very important. You know, that's the bottom line. When it was time certain in the afternoon or at six, um, there were some occasions where I might be here, I might be part of an appeal, and we had to stop halfway through for oral communications. And that was, the, I think, the worst of all possible worlds. And I'm sure for other people's issues, they felt the same way. Uh, so I'd urge you to not go in that direction where it might be broken up in the afternoon. And if you're not always having an evening session, then it seems that the beginning of the um, council meeting uh, is perhaps the uh, best of all alternatives, although it's not going to be good for people who are at work. However, uh, with Zoom, 
maybe that does open that up. But nothing is perfect, but I, I do think just sharing those few thoughts from past experience hope will be helpful. And thank you for considering this, very important. Thank you. Now back to the person online. We'll be with you in just a moment. Hello. Ms. Bush, we're ready to go. Good afternoon. Hello. Have you got me? Yes, Mr. Geiger. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, well, <laughs> the reason I'm uh, going in here on Zoom is I tried repeatedly to use the telephone access, and I'll admit I'm pretty lousy at uh, technology, but uh, anyway, I got through one way. Uh, I just wanted to comment on uh, Council Member Brown's uh, urgings to make this process more open and, you know, more accessible to democracy. Uh, maybe I'm a futz, you know, and, and have a hard time getting on, but a certain number of people are going to be having trouble. And also, you know, it's more effective to come down personally. And it, it always worked. I think there was a few people who abused it, but there's time limits, etc. It always worked for the community. It had much more community participation when there was a fixed time. Uh, personally, I favor uh, seven o'clock, but you know, it's, you got to go with whatever works for the majority of people. But with COVID, you know, everybody sort of dropped out of dealing with the government and dealing with everything, and that's not healthy. And we can encourage people to come if we can tell them when to come. I hope to bring some petitions down later today. And it's on me because I'm retired and I'm one of the very few people that can try to jockey around with all the agenda timing and maybe get down there without spending the whole afternoon on a hard pew. I'm 76 years old. I got arthritis. You guys have comfortable padded chairs. Give us a break. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kiker. Thank you. Anyone else with us wish to comment on this? Do we have anyone else online? Okay. Matters back before the council. I wonder if the appropriate motion, let me ask the city attorney on this. Uh, Mr. City Attorney, uh, I, would, I would suggest to the council that a motion on this would be to approve item nine as submitted uh, with the exception of continuing item 6.5 on the policy portion of this uh, with direction to the mayor, the city manager, and other appropriate staff to meet and return uh, at an appropriate time, but not later than a meeting in September uh, with uh, a revised set of recommendations on item 6.5. Would that be in order, sir? Yes, I would also uh, 6. recommend that you add 6.6 .6 as well. And 6.6? .6. And 6.6. .6. Is there a motion in that regard? Sure. I'm happy to move that motion. I'll second. Ms. Brown, a second <laughs> debate you. or discussion on Can this? Can I ask one more? Yeah, I have one more question. Yeah, Ms. Brown. Uh, so, <laughs> could length, so 6.7, lengthy reports. Um, it just says lengthy, and I appreciate, I like the policy, um, but I, could we put some parameters there? What I, I know I've heard 15, 10 minutes, I think. Um, is there, just to give people a sense of what that means, lengthy? I don't know. It, it's not essential, but it just feels a little weird to say lengthy, and it's kind of subjective, and we don't know what that means. Why don't we bring that back? 6.7 to include we'll 6.7. I guess yeah. we, yeah, okay. We'll bring so we'll back. bring, we'll we'll bring 6.7 six, six, back as six, well. Thank seven. you. Both are uh, pulled out of this direction to the city manager and the mayor, meet and can discuss on this item, bring it back no later than a meeting in September of <laughs> these items. There is a motion and a second. Further debate or discussion? Tony, do you have the motion? Sorry, I want to make sure that you have it clear. I do. Um, I do want to just clarify that um, in addition, I can put it in the motion if you want, but in addition to the policies regarding um, oral communications, we would also update the council handbook at the same time to align each That's other. Very good. We're not back and forth. Either. Very good. Wonderful. All debate having ceased, the clerk will call the roll. Councilmember Newsom? Aye. Brown? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Bruner? Councilmember Bruner? Aye. Calentari Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. And Mayor Keeley? Aye. Motion passes and so ordered.
to my agenda item. So, Ms. Brown, that dispenses with your items, I believe. Uh, we will move to item 11. Uh, thank you, Mr. M. Wally. Looking forward. Thank you. Good, good afternoon, much, Mayor and Council. Good afternoon, sir, and thanks to you and your staff for the good and very hard work that you do every day. It's very much appreciated, sir. Sure. On this item, I want to be certain that, that I understand or that, that what I am thinking is the case going into budget year plus one is true. If I understand this, we have uh, a multi-million dollar award from the state of California, and we are using that uh, to as the appropriation or the funding of this contract, correct? That is correct. And that homeless grant from the state of California uh, had was a total of fourteen million dollars. We have we have spent a fair amount of that. How much have we spent before we authorize this contract? Good question. I the budget we presented and adopted in June included both the fourteen million from the state as well as ARPA funds that were approved by council. And I know we had si just over six million remaining with those two sources. And at hand, I don't have the specific amount for each of those. Listen up, right? About s six left. Correct. And uh, this is four of that, which remained, which means two million left. Correct. Okay. I can't do math, but I can do arithmetic. Uh, they're different. Um, if we approve this, and uh, we have this $4 million contract with to run the Overlook program and all of its component parts, in budget year plus one, I'm going to assume that even that $2 million might not be here. We, I suspect we have other ideas with that $2 million of the remaining. So we get to July 1st next year, which is budget year plus one. We start the new fiscal year uh, next year on July 1st. And let's assume for a moment that we want to continue this. Am I right in thinking that absent an additional grant from the state or some other stranger who may want to give us money? that if we want to continue this, this is a city general fund obligation at that point. Correct. Absent any other new revenue source that may be available, that would be correct. The governor and the legislature yesterday reached an agreement on the state's fiscal year budget. And uh, in reading what the League of Cities and others have said about this, about the uh, budget agreement reached between the legislature and the governor, I did not at least see popping up to me that the state is going to renew. Uh, there, There is not, as I read the budget agreement, there is not an agreement to continue to fund this program from the state level. Correct. Correct. That, correct. that was a one-time uh, grant legislative remark. And in their budget, they are not somehow renewing this or saying, well, it's no longer this color dollars. Uh, but don't worry about that because there's these other color dollars we're going to route your way. There is no such thing in the state's budget. Is that correct? To the best of my knowledge, that is correct. Okay. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Those are my questions on this item. And my point is to say that, which I won't belabor, uh, which is uh, that converting this from bringing our state tax dollars back in town, letting us spend it on that. Absent that, we're going to be in a position where if we want to continue this level of shelter and transportation and meals and so on, it'll come straight out of the city's general fund. And uh, I think that is a, a highly problematic um, concept in the context of precious general fund spending and all of the pressures on the city council 
to spend general fund monies uh, on a wide variety of very pressing issues in the city of Santa Cruz. Let me see, uh, someone pulled item 12, and if you'll forgive me, uh, this is the, uh, I believe someone pulled item 12 on the tier three. Ms. Brown, was that you? This, it was a request from Mr. Norse. Okay. And, which, and I have said I will pull items. I didn't get an email because I can't get my access to my email. That so. item? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Oh. Item 10 we'll, we'll, we'll was pulled, right? I'll, I'll be glad to take that up. Uh, item 11, we'll, we'll take public comment on that. Good afternoon, sir. So, um, item 11, we want you all to remember that the city spent a quarter million dollars recently demolishing people from their makeshift homes along Highway 9 and six months before that, a million dollars in demolishing the bench lands and creating a huge refugee population that is still refugee in the city. So I'm sure that I would imagine your staff, uh, city manager, Larry M. Wally, can give you some notion of uh, the estimate of police and service time that was spent and the cost of that, let's say, compared to um, what might have been spent for simple shelter of some kind for folks. I mean, it's been suggested by uh, Reggie Meisler that there be uh, vehicles, cheap vehicles be purchased. There's all kinds of concerns and problems about that. But if you consider the huge amount of expense that's being uh, spent, I'm just looking specifically before this gets voted on, I'd like to see uh, the comparison with how much all these enforcement actions have cost and how much they will likely cost in the next few months, or if you will, in the next year, based upon past experience and whatever reasonable predictions can be made. And I would say this appropriation should be delayed until such time as an analysis is made. Uh, and then also uh, unclear in some of the stats are the longevity and nature of the so-called uh, permanent or I don't know, alternate housing obtained for a small minority of the participants. And I say this not to disparage the shelter that is being provided per se, but to suggest that the money, uh, that while that's happening, you need to stop criminalizing the people who are making their own shelter and perhaps contributing some of that money to the most essential services. Porta potties that have been removed, wash stations that have been removed, electrical outlets that have been removed, trash pickups that have been made more infrequent. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Do we have anyone online on this item? No hands yet. Okay. Good afternoon again, sir. Um, <clears throat> Bonnie, I'm a little confused why item seven got kind of skipped, but. Um, I do have a comment on this item, but uh, maybe, maybe someone can can you know, enlighten me why why seven was walked over or, sorry, or it, passed over. It was uh, it was included um, in the permitting, the, the like the betting limits and the casinos and the. Maybe when you ask a question, um, then when I provide an answer, we don't cross talk. Yeah. Item seven was included as one of the items on the consent agenda. Oh. And it was all taken up as one motion except those items. Oh, okay, pardon me. Yeah, okay. I, I only heard the names of certain, excuse me, I only heard uh, the names of certain uh, items and I didn't hear seven. Uh, okay, now I understand. Um, four million dollars? Um, you know, I mean, I mean the modulo on that 48,000, that's, that's more money than, you know, I made in two years as a, a grocery checker. Um, but, you know, that's, I mean, that that, I feel like giving it, you're giving it to the right people if you give it to the Salvation Army. Um, I feel like all of it going to the Salvation Army is maybe a little, you know, kind of problematic. But deciding who it goes to is similar to, um, I guess it's like the Volunteer Center and don't, you know, to, don't, you know, don't United Way or you know, like all the different charities. You know, who, who gets it? And there's a lot of desperation about like who gets it and why. Um, I feel there are other shelters in the city that are administrated um, in different ways that help different. People, you know, uh, speaking of, you know, diversity, you know, being parallel to variety, you know, and, and there's a certain uh, 
beauty and uh, redundancy. Uh, you can say that again. Um, okay, anyway, um, yeah, I'm a big fan of uh, Elm Street right there by the Metro. Uh, and it, they're not traditionally considered a shelter, but they do have kind of um, features of that. And then there are other places in the city. I mean, uh, it's funny how I've, I've noticed there are more pizza places in the city than there are uh, churches. But there are a lot of churches, and the churches are kind of there for a reason. That's for people of faith to help people in need uh, often. You know, that's, that's their purpose. They're, they're kind of their mission. So, um, anyways, uh, I've said too much. I haven't said enough. I'm done. Thank you, sir. Anyone else online on this item? Uh, uh, Mr. Imwali, ask you one other question on, on item 11, uh, and that is, uh, does the county of Santa Cruz uh, operate, are they the lead agency in operating shelter? Uh, Directly, they do not. Through the Continuum Care, they fund shelter operations at a number of sites across the county, but in terms of directly operating one, no, they don't. Mm -hmm. Do they operate any, sh the degree to which they do fund, do they operate something that we would say is equivalent to what we're doing under this contract? Do they do something equivalent anywhere in the county? I believe the uh, shelter that is operated, Navigation Center in South County in Watsonville, also operated by the Salvation Armory, is a good analog. Mm -hmm. And is that the counties or the city and the county of uh, city of Watsonville and the county? That I believe is county mm -hmm. specifically, not including the city of Watsonville. So in mid county to north county, does the county operate in the unincorporated area? Anything similar? to what we operate in the city of Santa Cruz? In the north part of county, the, the shelter at Housing Matters within the city limits is the most uh, substantial and um, most uh, comparative um, shelter that the county funds. Do we, all co do we also contribute as a city to that operation? Uh, not specifically to the shelter operations, but the broader infrastructure on that campus. So for example, we recently uh, spent 1.6 million, I believe it was, for a renovation of the hygiene bay and the poly lofts, uh, ground leases for the property and parcels over there. So significant infrastructure investments. And is it right that about half of the counties, in the most recent point in time survey, that roughly half of the folks who are currently unhoused countywide and including in the four cities, about half of that's in the unincorporated area, about half, would that be right? Uh, it's more of a 60-40, I think it's approximately 63% uh, within the city limits of Santa Cruz and 37% uh, in the remainder of the county. Mm -hmm. And if I understand it, the cities of Scotts Valley and Capitola have, with their adopted budgets, are not participating in any of this, is that correct? Uh, they make uh, jurisdictional contributions to the continuum of care, and so those are uh, contributions I'm aware of. I'm not familiar with any other contributions. They don't operate shelters in their communities? That is correct. Okay. And the county uh, operates something in South County and contributes to something at Housing Matters, but otherwise the county of Santa Cruz does not operate shelters in the complete and robust way that we offer that at the uh, at the armory including the overlook campground and the safe parking for vehicles and so on is that correct uh correct um and it, you know at, it, with the exception of what we've already discussed with housing matters in the north county and the salvation army uh, down in watsonville there's other small shelters that they contribute some funding to, uh, but nothing at the scale of those two that we've nothing discussed. Nothing at the scale that we do. I raise that, and thank you, Mr. Imwell. I raise all of this for the obvious reason of saying, we're gonna do this this year. Next year, we wanna do this. Absent any other changes, It's if we wanna do this, it comes straight out of our general fund. 
the county, in my view, is not stepping up to take care of its share of the responsibility, either in the unincorporated area or in the city of Santa Cruz, uh, which is the county seat. And I think that that's a very significant failure on the part of the county of Santa Cruz. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, all debate having ceased on this item, clerk will call the roll. I think we have a move the item. Yeah, right. I'll move Thank the you. item. I'll move item um, 11. Thank you. Second. Second by Ms. Kalantari Johnson. The clerk will call the roll. Councilmember Newsom? Aye. Brown? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Bruner? Aye. Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. And Mayor Keeley? Aye. We are on item 12. This item was uh, continued at the request of, this is the tier three safe parking operation. Did you ask for this, sir, to be pulled? Please come forward. On item, uh, we are on item 12. Good afternoon, sir. Yes, I'm sorry. Sure, sure. Um, so I'm, I'm in favor of the successful expansion of the Tier 3 program, of course. Who yeah. isn't? Uh, but of course, the specific costs of expanding the program to actually service the 50-person waiting list, uh, who will then be, if it isn't, vulnerable to the OVO, uh, is a, a very serious question. So. Considering the city made a commitment to the Coastal Commission that it would provide access to the coast for everyone, and part of that was the issue of people who live in their vehicles and those being oversized vehicles, because that was the ordinance that they were considering. So um, this, of course, is going to come up in two other items that are on this agenda, so I'm not going to belabor it. But my question here is what provisions, as a part of this appropriation, have been made for the waiver program? I don't mean the permits for the year that you can get four of them for a year for, what, 12 days. That's not for, that has nothing to do with overflow from the uh, waiting list situation for people who can't get into the Tier 3 program. And that's the majority of people in their vehicles, as I understand it from uh, Evan Morrison's account of this. He runs that program. So you need to freeze all enforcement against people who are in their vehicles, not relating to particular health and service and safety needs, done with regard to the Martin versus Boise uh, uh, guidelines, because they don't have any options. The Coastal Commission was advised that these would be the options. They're not included in this appropriation. You're advancing this appropriation without those options being specified, and without a procedure for getting those waivers, as far as I understand it. And again, it's rather complicated and lengthy, so maybe I'm missing something. And if I am, good for the staff for doing that. But I haven't seen that. And folks who are going to be suffering because of this, uh, and the, the police are going to be running people around, even those who have their own shelter in vehicles. It's, it's senseless, it's outrageous, and it also is, I think, not particularly cost productive. Uh, and I'll leave it there. Thank you. Do you have anyone else who wishes to comment on the item? Good. All right. There is a, we have a motion on this item. I'll move it. As recommended. As recommended. Motion as recommended. Second. There's a second. Second on this item, Ms. Brown. Further debate or discussion on this item? Seeing and hearing none, clerk will call the roll. Um, did you make the motion? I did. Okay, thank you. Um, Council Member Newsom? Aye. Brown? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Bruner? Aye. Valentari Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. And Mary Keeley? Aye. Motion passes and so ordered. I believe item 20 was continued. I got my question answered on that item. 
uh, I've received my answer on that. So I believe a motion to approve as recommended would be in order. Is there such a motion? May I ask, yes. uh, Council Member Bruner, did you get your questions answered? I thought we had kind of delayed here because my question was answered, but then you had a follow-up. That was based on the, you're right, the public comment on weekend traffic. Yes. Yeah, so, um, hi. <laughs> Welcome back. Good afternoon. Council member. Um, so my question was on item 20, um, the, uh, there was public comment regarding the uh, impact study, traffic impact study, and it was stated that um, based on our general plan, traffic impact studies are conducted peak uh, afternoon weekday hours, and um, community member, the community member who spoke, and I've heard in the past at some other um, meetings that uh, there's concern because of weekend tourism traffic um, is heavily increased. Um, I don't have data on what that is and how that would impact. And yeah. if it, I'm just curious about, um, you know, what it would take to, to it, it, at first sight, it doesn't seem like it would hurt to have that data and, so, and it might even support us in a certain way or support something else. But um, I'm just wondering if you could speak to that. I know earlier you mentioned cost was an <laughs> obstacle and you know I think it's important to look at the big picture of weighing all the costs that go into a, a, a large expansion plan like this, so. Yeah, um, mm. thank you for the opportunity to talk about this uh, again. Um, I think the, the first part is really the separation of the sort of vehicular delay conversation and level of service from our CEQA analysis requirements. And so the scope of work that was developed is really to comply with CEQA. I think there's, that's a really important dividing line for us here. Um, the sort of issue with studying Saturday is one that it would be very hard to mitigate a, a Saturday peak in the, uh, in the summer. And so the challenges with those would actually be in conflict with some of our general plan policies that actually ask us to accept more congestion in our downtown to make it a more pedestrian, bicycle-friendly environment. So because of that, if we, you know, if we study it, we're going to come up with this solution that's going to say, oh man, we should build a really big roadway here. But that would actually, in fact, be in conflict with what we actually want to do in the area. Is that... But if that's what the data shows we need, then we need to know that information, right? Um, I think the, gen but the general plan also tells us to not do that. So that's the, that's the challenge that we have here. E, would you like to add anything? Yeah. <laughs> I would, if I could. Thank you, Lee oh, Butler, Planning Community Development Director. Um, the challenge is that the two are often at odds. Um, if you're planning for vehicular convenience, then you're gonna create a situation where um, pedestrians and bike bicycles have a harder time navigating the area. And so in our downtown, we're prioritizing the pedestrian and bicycle environment because we know that that's how we want people to be able to move around in that area. And so if we are um, if we are mitigating to Saturday afternoon traffic on you know July 10th, um, then um, there would be, and, and I say that mitigation as outside of CEQA, because as Matt was saying, you know, this the LOS is outside of CEQA now. We have our transportation guidelines that speak to BMT as the CEQA measure. They speak to um, BMT as um, being a, a non-significant impact when you're in a half mile of high quality transit 
as is the case for this particular um, location. So we are not going to have a VMT impact, we're not gonna have a CEQA impact as it relates to transportation based on our transportation guidelines and um, the fact that the, the delta that we're studying is really not that large. Um, it's a large number of units in that area, but we're already planning for, uh, the plans already have over a thousand units in that area, right? So the number of additional trips is not based on the 1,600 or 1,800 units. It's based on the delta between what's already planned. Um, so between all of those factors, I'm not anticipating a significant impact under CEQA um, for VMT. But that LOS, we do have a local policy that speaks to, to LOS outside of CEQA. And that LOS is a measure of delay. And if we're looking at that measure of delay and contemplating that we should build our roadway network for the summertime weekends, we're gonna have a very wide roadway network. And that's gonna mean it's longer for people to cross, um, it's harder for bikes to navigate, and there's less land available for um, development because there is wider roadways. All of those are things that we're not trying to achieve in our downtown. We're trying to achieve a pedestrian oriented environment and one that's bike friendly. And so even if we were studying those weekend levels, we wouldn't be looking to mitigate outside of CEQA again to those levels. I know that's, that's a lot. No, <laughs> that was great. That totally, um help me understand and, and clarify um, uh, the goal here and um, what we're um, aiming for in terms of the downtown district and uh, the pedestrian bicycle friendly, less wider roads. Um, I just think at some point um, in this process, um, and when I say weekend, Saturday and Sunday, I notice each time you only mention Saturday, but to me, weekend is Saturday and Sunday, um, that there's um, a certain level of information that informs, that comes into effect when we um, are developing an area. Um, um, I think, you know, the public needs to understand, like, there's visions of choke necks and emergency vehicles. How will they get through if there's more cars on that narrow road? Um, where's the emergency vehicle going to go? Now it's going to take an hour to get across town. Those kinds of concerns somewhere need to be addressed um, and need to be in um, the informed data and in how we're moving forward with this project. I think I just I feel like that's really important for. Um, the community to see that, that that has been considered and somewhere in that, that, that we are uh, um, taking that into effect in X, Y, Z um, somewhere in there. Not that we're planning, um, like you said, your example, Highway 17 in that case would go straight to the beach, right? Um, so, but understanding that that area gets um, more traffic and um, in the summer and holidays and what are some of the things in in planning and development that we are doing to accommodate those limited not significant impacts yeah, um the, the piece there is I don't think we actually need to do a level of service analysis to know that Saturday is a, or Sunday or any major holiday is a challenge to drive around in this area. And that's why in the scope of work where we are looking at transportation demand management strategies, which are ways that you get people to bike and walk through the area more effectively. So we're looking to really reduce that impact as well of this project that we are studying. Um, the other element that's in there that would help existing uh, neighbors today is the study again of the, um, the Laurel Street extension connection between Front and Third, as I mentioned. Um, we don't need to do level of service to know that's a good idea to look at and really start to think about how that could be operationalized to create uh, a connection to that neighborhood and to the beach to get through those, um, you know, for emergency vehicles and whatnot on the, um, the busy days. So the the fact that we're not studying it uh, 
doing level of service analysis isn't that we don't uh, care about the issue or think that it's a challenge. It's just that the solutions we we have um, for those um, are beyond widening the roadways and all of that sort of items that Lee talked about. They're about reducing the transportation demand uh, for people driving in the area. And those solutions are ones that are in the scope already that we'll look at in the study. Um, can I ask that that continues to be a, a priority emphasis um, that's called out as that this process moves forward, that the, the community really understands that and it's clear. Yeah. Thank you. Further on this item? I just have one comment. Ms. Watkins. Um, I appreciate the further discussion and I understand the logic and um, the conflict amongst the two. Um, what I'd be interested in knowing over time as we have these studies conducted and the mitigations in place and increased um, active transportation options, how are we tracking uh, use and what does that look like and what are we seeing as effective interventions or mitigations and could those be replicated? So as we look at it contextually in terms of the bigger picture, over time I think as we kind of continue to invest in our downtown and see growth and have fee cycle and other alternatives available, um, how are those playing into either kind of no net gain or in terms of like we're not seeing any additional rides, but we're not seeing um, less I, or, or not, but just to track that I think over time would be really beneficial, but that's just my comment. It's kind of a bigger picture comment. <laughs> Thank you. I'm happy to move the item. Ms. Brown. Oh, just a quick comment, follow-up comment, uh, because, I, you know, I, 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 I recognize the the challenge you face here, and I agree that uh, looking towards alternative transportation and developing that infrastructure is really critical. So I, I, I'm with you there. However, the concerns will, um, you know, continue to be present. I think particularly for people, as um, Ms. Greensight suggested, who um, really do use that that corridor for commutes, and it's one of the only ways to get to the west side, really, from downtown. So um, it it will have a significant impact that isn't really being um, fully addressed, I think, from the public's perspective, at least some members of the public. And um, so I feel like we, if, if you could, I'm making a plea here that as those community meetings move forward, as the conversation is happening with the community, that this issue be addressed, um, that, that you all be prepared to talk about that and, and what you're doing um, in order to just not, so that people understand and that there's a response to those concerns as they arise. Um, so I, I just want to put an emphasis on that as well. Thanks, Council Member Bruner. For the questions or comments on the item? I believe there is a motion and a second. Ms. Bush? Sorry, who was the second? I moved it. But I is a motion here? I think it was Hannah. I can second. Yes, that's right. <laughs> Ms. Brown did second that. For the debate or discussion, seeing and hearing it. Ms. Bush, good on this? Mm -hmm. Okay, seeing and hearing none. Clerk will call the roll. Council Members Newsom? Aye. Brown? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Bruner? Aye. Helen Terry Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. And Mayor Keeley? Aye. Motion passes and so ordered. Item 22 was requested to be pulled. This is overnight parking permit fees related to oversized vehicles. Whoever asked this to be pulled, I believe that I believe you that did was that Mr. Mr. Mm -hmm. Mr. Norris. Mr. Norris. Mr. Wanted Norris to. on item 22. Good afternoon. I think not to belabor this because it's really been brought up a lot. Oh, probably should be belabored. Um, and I think uh, the mayor referenced this as well he, uh, earlier. Uh, the, the situation here is do you want to advance a permit process at the same time? And this is a repetition of what I said before, but it's the same substance. And it, it relates to that issue, which is there's going to be plenty of people who are going to be under f under a danger once the once you pass the OVO and it, and a month passes and it's in, in in effect, they will have that's where they live, and they can't get permits. And until this this particular proposal 
uh, actually includes them in a meaningful way because there is no option for them. The options supposedly granted by this council under the CSSO and the OVO do not exist for the majority. You must not allow this to happen without there actually being a real process in place. Wait until the process is in place, then reconsider this. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Ms. Bush, is there anyone online who wishes to comment on this item? Um, no hands are raised. Okay. Anyone else who is present with us? Good afternoon again, sir. Uh, hi, I live in a trailer park, and um, there's, um, there's 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 few, few in the. I mean, there's some. You know, they're, they're, they have kind of an interesting history. A lot of them do. Like, you know, it's a uh, it's um, short of a high rise, you know, where you can stack a lot of people, you know, uh, trailer parks very practical. Um, there's always that one guy who kind of rubs you the wrong way in the park. And I'm, you know, certainly not that guy to anybody. Um, I know, uh, yeah, um, I know that living in a vehicle is um, very, very uh, tricky. There are a lot of chutes and ladders, you know, where can you park, where, where can you, you know, get, get in trouble for parking and, um, uh, back when I was, uh, was in my early 20s, I uh, rented a, a VW van from a guy. And, uh, you know, I parked in various places that today you just you wouldn't think of parking there because the city's gotten bigger. Tra you know, traffic's, you know, kind of traffic parking, et cetera. So uh, I think this is hand-in-hand hand with a lot of your, your issues with, um, you know, like we're talking about emergency vehicles on weekends in the summertime. Um, that, is, that is a very, very, very important issue. Um, I like, uh, well, I wanted to speak on the last issue. I'm kind of speaking on the last issue a little bit, but I think it does pertain. Um, I, I feel like parking in infrastructure, um, one thing I've noticed is the Galleria parking lot doesn't have an elevator. And then, uh, so that, um, that dissuades people from using it. And I've discussed with Don Lane the possibility of uh, them retrofitting uh, an elevator, just like those, uh, um, those elevators made by the, uh, company that, you know, like is the elevators on the uh, Pacific Avenue uh, buildings that are going up, you know, an external elevator just to retrofit it with an elevator, not that big of an engineering issue, and you, you've uh, increased the utility of the parking. Uh, another thing I, I like is the, the summertime circulator, uh, the shuttle, and I feel like it, it could be more of a, like a circulator or maybe using uh, SEMTD funds to, uh, you know, uh, like Watsonville has a really sweet circulator. I don't never ridden it. I don't get over to Watsonville as often as I'd like, but uh, Santa Cruz could probably benefit from having something that takes people from, say, the county uh, building parking lot on weekends, which has nobody parked there often, and down to the boardwalk. And, you know, people knew, oh, it's easy to go to Santa Cruz. You just, you know, you can park at the, you can, you can often find parking at the uh, county building and then get on this simple shuttle thing that takes you to the, maybe it would be included in their, their parking fees at that location to uh, get, have a free, you know, transit uh, via the shuttle. Anyway, um, well, yeah, well, how that pertains to people parking in their vehicles. There's less pressure on, on people if, you know, everything's harmonious with all the transit. Thank you. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Ms. Bush, still no one else online. Anyone else wish to comment on this item? Seeing and hearing none, matter is back before the council. It is the pleasure. I have the pleasure of moving item 22. You're going to move item 22. Item Motion to move as recommended. Is there a second? second. Ms. Kalantari Johnson second. seconds the motion for the debate or discussion. Seeing and hearing none, the clerk will call the roll. Councilmember Newsom? Aye. Brown? No. Watkin? Aye. Bruner? Aye. Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. And Mayor Kulig? Aye. Motion passes and so ordered. We are now on item 28. Item 28. Item 28 is a second reading and final adoption of an ordinance related to parking of oversized vehicles. Is there a uh, any report on this? We have uh, material in our packet. Uh, let me see if there is public comment on this item. 
Seeing and hearing none, matter is back before the council for any questions, comments. Is there a motion on this item? Is there anyone online who wishes to comment on it? Matter is back before the council. Is there a motion? Second. Motion by Ms. Watkins, a second by Mr. Newsom. All debate having ceased, the clerk will call the roll. Councilmember Newsom? Aye. Brown? No. Watkin? Aye. Bruner? Aye. Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. And Mayor Keeley? Aye. Item passes and so ordered. Members, we are on item 29. This is a cooperative retail management business real property improvement district assessments for the upcoming fiscal year. Okay. Hi, Mayor. Uh, good afternoon, Ms. Lipscomb. You are presenting Hi, I have on this staff item. Staff members running over to the council chambers as we speak, so I thought I would just jump jump on and introduce the item. Thank item you. came up a little faster than we were anticipating. Sure. Um, we we also, as they're running over right now, um, I did want to take just a minute and say that to date we've received um, out of several hundred you know properties in the area, uh, 31 ballots returned. Um, we will be tallying those as part of this process. Um, this assessment, it's been over 10 years since we've um, actually increased the downtown assessment. We've held it flat for a variety of sort of economic reasons in the downtown, but we've now fallen pretty significantly behind what the actual cost is of providing the services. So the recommendation and the assessment um, that's related to the ballot today relates to increasing that cost to bring it more in line with the cost of delivering the services and then also a separate sort of ballot for those in an expanded district on a portion of Front Street and a portion of Cedar, recognizing that the downtown is larger than the existing district and the needs for those services is larger than the existing district. So that's uh, what is before you today. As I said, we've received about 31 ballots. Um, protest ballots. Um, we do believe we only need about five minutes to tally those ballots. Um, so um, uh, I have my team, if they've entered the council chambers, I can I can turn it over to them um, to proceed. And um, if we can recess um, once we open the hearing and um, we'll be in the uh, courtyard conference room. We only need five minutes and then we can return um, to the council chambers. So with that, I'll turn it over to my team. Ms. Unit, good afternoon. Good afternoon, uh, Economic Development Manager Beth Unit. Um, so today we are here for our public hearing for the Downtown Management Corporation, excuse me. Um, so we have received a number of ballots ahead of this meeting. Um, and so this is the period where uh, we count those ballots, determine if our assessment has passed, um, and then welcome any public comment on it or uh, protest during this meeting. So happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Ms. Unit. Are there questions of Ms. Unit? Thank you for your, your appearance here today. <clears throat> Let me ask if there's public comment on this item. Is there anyone on line, Ms. Bush? Nobody with their hands up. No one with their hands up. Thank you. The uh, Ballots are in the possession of the clerk. Let me take just a moment. This doesn't happen very often here uh, where we do this kind of thing. Let me add additional complexity to it, and that is that the city clerk's very trusted right-hand person uh, uh, went home ill uh, today at the beginning of our council meeting. What we're going to do in order to make this as easy as, as possible we will take a recess here rather than have uh, try to do uh, too many things simultaneously. So you need about five minutes. I'd say 10. You will absolutely have 10. We are at 2.30. We are going to take recess until 10.40. Uh, excuse me, 2.40. I was just hoping. <laughs> Those are free of it's like, I'm coming back. 
Council is back in session and a note to some council members, recess for the summer will begin on adjournment of this meeting, <laughs> not during this meeting. Okay, we are on item 29. Uh, this is uh, uh, a uh, improvement district assessment issue. The ballots have been counted. Ms. Unit will recognize you. Um, so we have completed the counting of our ballots um, and we only received uh, no votes uh, around 8% for the first question which was to increase the assessment. Uh, we received about 9% no votes on the current assessment and 5.8% no votes on the expansion of the district. So without reaching the 50% threshold, um, those uh, have passed. And so we ask that the council move the staff recommendation. Let me see before you leave the podium there. Uh, are there questions or comments of Ms. Unit on this? Thank you very much. And Ms. Bush, thank you and your team so much for help tallying the ballots. Matters back before the council. Let me ask if there are questions or comments. Let me see if there are any uh, public comments on this. We are uh, a motion to approve as recommended based on the results of the tallying uh, would be in order. I'll move the recommended action. Moved by Mr. Newsom, second by Ms. Brown. For the debate or discussion, seeing and hearing none, the clerk will call the roll. Councilmember Newsom? Aye. Brown? Aye. Watkin? Aye. Hmm. Um, Bruner? Um, disqualified. Um, Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. And Mayor Keeley? Aye. Motion passes and so ordered. Thank you all very much for your fine work on that. We're on item 30. This is an appeal of the proposed single space marking on David Way. As indicated earlier uh, in our morning session, the appellant has withdrawn their application. Uh, so there is no item 30. We are on item 31, the five-year strategic plan. Excuse me for just a moment. Ah, the vice mayor's made a good recommendation, and, and I think we'll follow this. As I understand it, there are several people here who are here on item 32. Is that correct? Folks are back here on item 32. Let's, let's take item 32, then we can return to 31. I think we might be able to, to move on this rather quickly. We're on item 32, the 2022 Commission for the Prevention of Violence Against Women annual report. I will recognize Ms. Long. Uh, to present on this item. And good afternoon. Good afternoon, good afternoon Mayor good afternoon. and Council Members. So my name is Emmeline. I am the Principal Management Analyst for the City Manager's Office and also the staffer for the Commission for the Prevention of Violence Against Women. Uh, so today, as we bring forward to you as a 2022 CPVW Annual Report, and I just want to take a moment to really thank the members who are here today and also introduce um, the public to the members here. So we have Chair Long. And uh, for the rest of the commissioners, so to please stand up real quick so I could introduce you as well. And we also have Vice Chair Simonton. Give a wave. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we have uh, Commissioner Novak, Commissioner Bollinger, Commissioner Trujillo. Commissioner Feynman, and Commissioner Madura. So everyone is here, so it's very exciting. Um, so, you know, despite the challenges and the things that were happening um, with Commission, and they overcame, and we've adapted, and really worked together to achieve a lot of the things in 2022. And without further ado, I will pass this uh, along to Chair Long. Thank you very much. Ms. Long, good afternoon, and thank good you for afternoon. all of your service to our community in so many ways. I know we did, uh, you were a member of it. I was merely the convener in the Public Safety Task Force several yes. years ago, and your very thoughtful work on that was, was very helpful, and thank you for your continued work on the commission. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to present our annual report for 2022. Good afternoon to all of you. Thank you for having us today. Uh, as Em said, my name is Danielle Long. I'm the chair for the Commission for the Prevention of Violence Against Women. And as a commission, our meetings have been over Zoom until March of this year. So we're excited to 
to return to in-person meetings as well as presentations. Um, and then we have the entire commission here as well to um, present. The commission, so some of our highlights for the year, the commission hosted a three-day event from October 28th to October 20th to mark Domestic Violence Awareness Month with the goal of engaging the community in the commission's vision of ending sexual violence, sexual harassment, and domestic violence in the city of Santa Cruz. The three-day event included a screening of the powerful documentary titled My Name is and Andrea at the Del Mar Theater in downtown Santa Cruz, followed by a compelling discussion amongst those in attendance, a, <clears throat> excuse me, a statement from CPVAW and a mayoral de declaration from then Mayor Bruner. Thank you for that. We hosted over 125 uh, community members and collaborated with Walnut Avenue Family and Women's Center, as well as Monarch Services. Both agencies were present and provided resources and uh, information at a table at the event. The second event in the series was a sign-making event held at the Santa Cruz Museum of Art and History, whom we thank for providing the space for this event. Space and materials were provided, by com were provided for community members to come together to make signs denouncing sexual violence, as well as to hold space to share ideas about a world and community free of rape, sexual harassment, and femicide. Community members across Santa Cruz, MA staff, CPVAW commissioners, and members of the UCSC's The Women's Center were in attendance. On the final day, CPVAW hosted a rally and march to close out the three-day event for Domestic Violence Awareness Month. This event, started on the steps, on the front steps of 701 Ocean Street, where we had an incredible lineup of speakers, including members of the community, musicians, authors, poets, community activists, a council member, all of whom are named in our report. This event was recorded and also posted on YouTube for community members to view. Following the rally, members of CPVAW marched collectively with members of the community. This was our first community event since the pandemic, marking 41 years of CPVAW. We look forward to many future collaborative events promoting the mission and vision of the Commission to Prevent Violence Against Women. In addition, CPVAW worked to increase public information around the prevention of violence by distributing educational and preventative messages printed on coasters and posters and distributed across the city at bars and restaurants as well as collaborating with Gadget Box to produce three 20-second videos, as well as two public service announcements highlighted in our report. I'm gonna... Okay. We have included the Santa Cruz Police Department data report for 2020 to 2022, where we can see the data for domestic violence, battery calls, rape cases, sexual assault, stalking, and homicide. Um, amongst intimate partners. Any questions about this um, report? This, is, this was provided at, to us by Santa Cruz Police Department. Um, and if anybody has any questions about that, then we can follow up with the police department to respond. Despite the many challenges of the pandemic, the backsliding of the years of progress through the overturning of Roe versus Wade, mm -hmm. CPVAW is proud to serve the Santa Cruz community and city council by continuing to work towards our collective vision of ending sexual assault, sexual harassment, and domestic violence through prevention, educational programs, and public policy. On behalf of CPVAW, I would like to thank the City of Santa Cruz, the City Council, as well as the Santa Cruz Police Department for your support and continued pri prioritization of working to prevent violence, sexual violence in the community. And here's, we, we also included some goals um, for our future where we want to increase visibility and impact uh, through events in the community, strengthen our community partnerships. We are working towards having some youth commissioners. We're working with the Santa Cruz County Office of Education to have a couple of youth commissioners on our commission in the um, 2023. And then also strength, strength and process through um, our annual uh, our annual report, which will include not limited to activities, metrics, goals, and objectives. So <clears throat> we're planning to uh, provide you with a 2023 report, most likely in December, since we've we've been a little bit behind because of the pandemic. 
Does anybody have any questions or comments? Let me see if members have questions or comments. Ms. Watkins. I just want to say thank you, and it's really encouraging to see the entire um, commission here. I served on this committee and this commission years ago, and I just appreciate the work. It's very important, and just want to thank you for your volunteer time and for your efforts in this way and serving our city in this way. So thanks for being here and for the report, and I appreciate the goals as well. Vice Mayor is recognized. I would just echo the same sentiment, and I appreciate that you're all here this afternoon, and um, thank you for your good work, and, your, and I appreciate you. Council member. Same, same, same. Thank you so much for all your work and the report and the additional information um, with the data included in your presentation. Um, and then I just had a comment that we, as part of the Children and Youth Bill of Rights, we are including a youth liaison in some of the work that we're doing. So maybe there's some opportunity to collaborate there with the youth commissioner that you're bringing. Yes, definitely. That would be great. Thank you. Ms. Brunner. Thank you to uh, the entire commission. Thank you for being here. It's great to see all your faces and appreciate the time that everyone puts into this really important work in our community. Um, thank you, Chair Long. And um, I appreciate also we had received an email with some questions, so I appreciate seeing some of that data and um, understanding uh, the goals. Thank you. Yeah. You want? To yeah, just one more question. Please, please. I just had a question. I really, I really liked the the uh, posters and the coasters and things you put out in the bars. Um, I'm wondering, and I, it's only because it came to me when I was at the airport the other day, and you had a thing about human trafficking, and that I know that it happens here in Santa Cruz, whether we want to admit it or not. And I wonder if there's an opportunity for this commission to explore ways that we can help prevent that in our community and I don't I don't know what that would look like but yes I think that's a great idea that yes <laughs> I thought, can I add to that I know that there's a there's a tri-county coalition working on that and you probably already know this chair long but um, there's some work being done on in a tri-county effort with um, child welfare services le leading it in our county yeah we can collaborate with them council member Newsom Thank you, Mayor Keeley. Uh, my comments will echo uh, my colleagues as well. I just want to thank you and your colleagues uh, on the commission for your, uh, uh, for your important work. Um, and I you know, really want to thank you for bringing awareness to these issues and for educating the communities on these issues as well. So thank you. Councilmember Brown. Thank you. I, too, appreciate the work of the CPVAW. And uh, I know it's been a challenging several years uh, for folks. And I, I just appreciate you all sticking with it and and really making uh, some uh, doing some some program and and events that that really make a difference and I want to ask if some questions about that um, so just to get a, a little bit more of an understanding um, because as we were reminded earlier today when we were doing policy rev council policy review um, that the CPVAW's policy statement core policy statement is really um, uh, about preventing rape and domestic violence in our, our community, that this should be one of our city's highest priorities. So I'm kind of reminding us of that as well, because you all don't have the resources that you need to do the job that you probably want to do uh, in, in addressing these issues in this regard. So uh, I want to thank you. Uh, and then I just, I wanted to ask uh, about the, um, how it is that your, col your collaboration with local stakeholders and law enforcement um, uh, you know, how you're working together to ensure that, that we have best practices for responding to uh, violent crime. Um, I'm glad to see the data now provided. It wasn't in the report, and we it used to be in the reports, um, and I, we've seen more extensive reports in the past. Uh, so I'm, I appreciate that, and I hope that that can be included, um, you know, officially in the document so that people have, when they go to look at this, they can see that data. Um, and um, so just a little bit more about the, that, um, you know, how you work with the, your local partners and, and law enforcement uh, to achieve your, your programmatic goals. We have a, so we have a committee that works with, um, we collaborate with Santa Cruz Police Department and the commission requests the stats that we get and that, that 
that are that we want to look at, and then we get those stats from our uh, right now our li liaison is Deputy Chief Bush. Um, that I, I don't know if that's going to change um, upcoming now that there's a lieutenant up in investigations. So we receive the, the he comes in and provides us with with a report of the cases that we're asking about. We don't receive personal information about be, anything that's anything that is can identify a victim. We don't because we don't want to include it into a public record. So we don't request any any personal information about any victims. Um, and then as far as our stakeholders and our partners, we uh, include them in any events that we do. We reach out to them um, when we have uh, agencies that ask to collaborate with us. We have, um, they'll, they'll use one of our um, brands, the CPVAW. So any anytime you see CPVAW on any kind of um, information out there in the public, it's because we're, we have a collaborative relationship with them. Thank you. And then I also wanted to ask you one other question, sort of related, um, about you know the, your strategies and discussions around how to engage the public um, in the work that you do. I'm asking this in part because you know some people. This was on the agenda. I had some people reach out, and they were mostly talking about issues that really are uh, issues that I said you should go to the CPVAW and have those conversations, right, and, and really att attend the meetings and talk with the commissioners. Um, and so um, I'm just wondering how how you work with the public, you know, how, what ways to engage the public in the work you do. Um, I know you have meetings. People don't always know. So how can we make it a space where you get also support from the public and you can communicate more about what you're doing in that space? We would love for the public to come, and now that, especially now that we're in person, our meetings are in person, they're posted just as the city council meetings are posted on the city's website, so people are able to, any, you can direct people to the website to look and see when our, what the agenda items are, um, and we welcome any community members to come. We, ha we have had a few, not many. Uh, during COVID, we had a few um, on Zoom, but again, not many, so, Anytime you have a um, community member reach out and wanting to collaborate or talk to us, please direct them to one of our meetings. We would love for the public to come out and, and talk to us. And then as far as um, a larger collaboration, we the events that I spoke of, um, that included, it was a three-day event where we invited community members to come out and make signs and then to march with um, with the commission, and then we had multiple speakers, and we also had the, the film where we had uh, about 125 community members attend. Great, great events. Uh, yeah. One of which I missed to it because I was teaching class, but um, they, they're great events. Uh, okay, last question related to, uh, I've heard about the PSAs, I haven't actually seen the PSAs, um, that's my bad, but um, I'm just wondering how, like, how those are going, I mean, are you, getting feedback about them, where are they shown, and kind of more generally, you know, social media and, you know, what you're doing there to kind of help maybe also market or advertise the work you're doing. So the, as far as the PSAs, I believe they're on the, on our, yeah, they're on the city website. And then we also have an Instagram page that, um, we don't have a ton of followers, but we do have an Instagram page and a Facebook page. And we have a Facebook page as well, so that's so we have our PSAs on that. The coasters. Does anybody have a coaster? We don't have any coasters on. I've, us, I've seen those. You've I seen actually, them. Yeah, yeah they're so they people can right. test their drinks to see if there's any, you know, their their drinks have been yeah. drugged. So awesome, really great. We give those out to the bars and restaurants. So everyone, I think the conclusion I have, I'll I'll um, wrap up here. Go oh, like <laughs> CPVW, um, become, you know, get, get on their IG feed and um, let's activate that Instagram, sorry. Um, if I know, I'm, not, I'm so not tech savvy. Um, and, um, you know, and then uh, just keep thinking about ways that we can help spread the word too. Yeah, and I think now that we're out in the public and we can have more public events, it's going to be much easier because for the last two years we haven't, even, you know, we've been meeting online, and so now that we're out, this is, I think it's going to
hopefully activate the community more. For the questions or comments. Okay. Ms. Long, thank you so thank very you. much. Let me see if there's anybody with us who would wish to comment upon this. And Ms. Bush, do we have anyone teed up online who wishes, please come forward. No, no one hands raised. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, um, Gillian Greenside. Uh, well, 41 years ago, I was one of the founders of the initiative that led to the commission, and I was its first chair in 81, 82, and then chair again in 2004 and 5, if I'm remembering correctly. So I want to appreciate, you know, each gen decade that volunteers step forward to uh, take on this difficult work. I'm going to be critical, and you did receive my email, mm -hmm. because I think it would be dishonest to not point out, and my comments are directed to the city, not to the commissioners. Sure. The comments are that you have an ordinance that mandates that preventing rape and domestic violence shall be one of the city's highest priorities. And I think that it's very clear that this has not been the case, uh, especially in the last, what, 15 years. When I was on the commission in 2005, I'll give a shout out to our teen representative, Amelia Cuevas, who was um, our teen rep for three years and uh, did an amazing job of bringing Latinas into the dialogue and we had events in the schools, etc. But at that time, we had a 20-hour-a-week designated staff person who did the work that obviously a volunteer meeting every two months cannot do. Uh, we had a budget that was sufficient to put on Teen Women's Day in the Civic where we brought from all of the county schools teen women for a day of education and awareness. We had a robust self-defence class for the community. My time's running out, so I can't go on. It was in my email. But the point is that since that time, and one important thing, we had an office downtown, a storefront office, where our supplies were, it was visible, community could come in to get resources. All that is gone. I understand that... That era, it was difficult budget times, but it hasn't been replaced. And now we feel it's sufficient to have a meeting every two months uh, with no office space and not a dedicated 20-hour-a-week staff person. I think the city has to step up to the plate and fulfil the requirements of the Ordinance 8129. Sorry my time's running out, but I would like to make the point that... We have oversight of the police department's function vis-a-vis -vis rape and domestic violence. Commissioners should be able to read all of the reports, not just get data. And from those reports, they're redacted, there's no personal information, give the community a picture of what is going on with respect to rape and domestic violence. That is not happening. And do we know the community doesn't know. Santa Cruz is unique in having a preponderance of rapes committed by men who are complete strangers to the women they rape. That is unique in the whole country. Doesn't make it worse. It means that your strategy for how to address that is quite different from uh, acquaintance, non-stranger rape. The commission has to be given the resources to get back on track so that you can proudly say and the community can know that as is mandated by the ordinance that the prevention of rape and domestic violence is one of the city's highest priorities. Thank you. Thank you. Good, Good afternoon. afternoon, Fred Geiger. I certainly lack um, Ms. Greensight's expertise in this matter, and I think it's kind of ironic that I'm up here as a non-woman looking at you and saying, uh, why don't you do what you said and fund this very important activity? Uh, when you look at some of the appropriations that go out every uh, meeting, like this one, you got hundreds of thousands, this consultant and that and that. I mean, looking at it only on a practical level, Santa Cruz is a tourist town. 
our reputation, it appears, is in jeopardy, especially with the number of sexual assaults by unknown persons to the victim. That that tells us tells me anyway that we don't have much uh, you know security going for our visitors. That could be very damaging to our to our tourist industry and our town in general. And one way you can help that is to adequately fund uh, these things she's mentioning. And I just want to say I was very impressed at the coaster idea. What a terrific idea, because I've, I've got daughters, granddaughters, you know, it's like that's really something that I tell them about all the time, and it's a real problem. That's really an excellent solution. So I hope you'll give them what, the kind of funding they used to have. I think they certainly did a lot for the money that they got. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Anyone else who's with us today? Anyone else online, Ms. Moore? No, back before the council. The uh, recommended action here is to accept the report. Is there such a motion? I'll move, the, I'll move the recommendation. Motion. Is there a second? Second by the vice mayor. Further debate or discussion on the item? Ms. Bruner. Thank you. Um, so I'm curious um, about um, if if anybody can state or can specify what that ordinance mandates, what spells out how that priority is, is implemented? I don't, I don't have that information offhand, but I'd be happy to look into it and report back to the council. Great, thank you. Um, and then um, I think that just kind of for me, um, in making sure, you know, that we, we listen to our community and when there are concerns that it's not a priority and we think it is and I, I see a lot of the work that is being done with the commission as examples of showing that it is a priority, but it seems like there has been past historical different ways of implementing that priority. And so I think it would be helpful to understand um, what's required, what um, the commission, maybe they can at a future meeting have a discussion about um, how they feel that they're implementing that priority um, and understanding that ordinance and making sure if um, the commission needs any further funding or resources specific for any type of uh, implementation that that comes to council via a commission recommendation. I think um, I know myself that's a huge priority. I think the city um, um, historically as long as I know and, and from working downtown, um, I remember that, that um, there have been various resources and even safe space stickers and windows and various efforts over the years, different creative ideas, different PSAs, different events. Um, so that was, that's my question. Thank you um, to the city attorney for getting back on that. Thank you. Ms. Watkins, then Ms. Oh. Brown. Ms. Watkins. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate you raising that. Having been on the commission over the years, I think it has um, kind of waxed and waned and had different resources at different times and different programming and um, an evolution of a, of a commission and a commission's um, implementation strategies make sense, right, in terms of what the needs are. And so if that is, um, if there are areas that are priorities that should come back before the, the full council for consideration, you know, naturally that should be something that we hear and um, have a, an opportunity to weigh in on. And I know M, um, as our staff person, is um, our liaison there and, and, you know, and thank you for your work as well. Um, I, I do remember reading the redacted report, so I do understand that component of it and that tracking that was helpful for the data. So I don't know at some point to get clarity on what's going on there. Um, I do have a question though, and I see our chief of police back there, and I was wondering if maybe you would um, want to speak to what the, some of the community members brought up in terms of the types of um, rapes by strangers, and I think if, if that statistically is true in the data, I mean, we, we want to know and um, have correct information or misinformation corrected. Good afternoon, Chief. Good afternoon, Council. Uh, Bernie Escalante, Chief of Police. Um, you know, I was looking at some information that is collected by the SART program that does the sexual assault kits countywide. 
over the last two years, 2021, 2022, there was a total of 125 SART exams that were completed by the program and a total of 10 that were indicated by the survivors as, as strangers. Um, so that's countywide. I can't speak necessarily. I don't have the data uh, for, for the city today. Um, but certainly one of them is too many, mm -hmm. right? So, um, but that's the numbers that I have as far as uh, that, that's generated out of this start, this art program that produces this report every year. Um, and there's also, uh, uh, our victim advocate also does a report at the end of every year that produces numbers such as calls for service, but it also covers not just sexual assault, but domestic violence, <clears throat> domestic violence related calls for service as well. Okay, well, I appreciate that. And I think, you know, longitudinal data and kind of contextualizing trends, I think will be helpful in their work and our strategies and their strategies as well. So I appreciate, I appreciate you speaking to that. And, and just to add to that, I, I looked at the data over the last 14 years, I, I felt like Going back just to 2020, 2021, the, the numbers are a little skewed, as we know, with COVID, with everything. Sure. Um, and, and on average, the, the police department has had 36 uh, sexual assault reports uh, per year. We've had high numbers, up to 50, maybe low 60s. Uh, I also want to bring your attention to 2014, um, our UCR report, uh, uh, reporting requirements changed through the FBI. It used to be just uh, 261 of the penal code rape, forcible rape was reported after 2014 or actually January 1st of 2014. The reporting now in includes a number of other kind of other sexual offenses. Um, so the numbers naturally uh, went up. But as a whole, over the last 14 years, that was our, our, our average. Um, some as low as the low 20s, but again, obviously none of them are, 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 are appropriate. Yeah, thank you. Anyone else on this item? Any other council members on this item? Ms. Brown. I just wanna echo, the, thank you for the, the um, response. I just wanna echo the um, sentiment of my colleagues in, uh, asking you all to really to to come to us when it, when there are things that you think resources that would be helpful for you, um, because it is true. This is a long history. I saw M. You kind of your eyes. <laughs> you, you, I saw the expression change when you heard a twenty hour a week position for this commission in the past, and so um, you know that erosion over time has affected the work. And I just want to echo that um, I think that we all have a responsibility to be open to. Um, supporting you and your uh, work. So when there are requests, please reach out. Further? Seeing and hearing none, the clerk will call the roll. Council Member Newsom? Aye. Brown? Aye. Watkin? Aye. Bruner? Aye. Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. And Mayor Keeley? Aye. Motion passes and so ordered. Thank you all very much for your terrifically good work. Thank you. Chief, thank you as well. Included in that, thank you. <clears throat> Members, we are on item 31. This is the five year strategic plan. Uh, good afternoon, Ms. Schmidt. Thank you, Mayor. Laura Schmidt, your assistant city manager. I am here to introduce Nancy Hedrick with Baker Tilly. They are the consulting firm that has been assisting us with our five-year strategic plan. As you all know, the last time we met to discuss this in person was an April 18th um, special council meeting, and it was a workshop, I believe, for most of the day. And based upon the feedback from you all, the departments, and especially our community, Baker Tilly has edited various components and pulled them together with, to make up our five-year strategic plan draft, which we are putting before you in the community and asking for your input today. And with that, I will hand it over to Nancy. Good afternoon. 
Good afternoon, Mayor, members of Council. It's nice to be back. Nice to see you today. Good to have um, you here. Delighted to present um, the strategic plan that is the culmination of lots of effort, including our time together back in April, as was mentioned by the Assistant City Manager. Um, but the, uh, the draft plan that we have provided to you is intended to reflect the content and the, the discussion that we all had together. Um, but today is an opportunity with fresh eyes, with fresh time to take a look at it, provide feedback. Uh, so I'm going to take us through uh, the content. I'll highlight those areas that have been updated and adjusted based on the, the time we spent together uh, and happy to take any questions as well. Thank you. If I can actually get a clicker to move. I don't know. Screen. You ask for, there we go. Okay. Um, so we'll do a quick overview, uh, kind of where we've been, how we got to today, just as a refresher for uh, the public, but also for each of you. Uh, then we will look at the draft elements of the strategic plan, including the vision statement, uh, and then those key focus areas, the goal statements and all of the strategies contained therein. Uh, that's really the meaty part of the plan. And so we'll walk through each of those. Uh, first of all, just a, a, a look back and a reminder as we started our workshop together in April, uh, we talked about the importance and value of strategic planning and really the um, commitment to looking at what are those big focus areas, those big rocks that you want to keep in sight, keep in view uh, for all of you, but also for your public. That's what leads us to the strategic plan. And now I'm just <laughs> testing Laura's skills on the... <laughs> Oh, there, we go. there we go. Yeah. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> there we go. There we go. All right. So here's the framework that we have used. Uh, this is you'll remember this from our our time together. Vision is aspirational. It's what you want to see for um, the city, for the community. It's a statement of the future, intended to be concise and memorable. Um, the focus areas, the strategic goals, and the strategies all align up to that. A little bit of a process overview. You'll recall we began. Um, way back in the, the latter part of last year, we did a series of interviews with members of council. We did a questionnaire with departments. We also did a community survey. We reviewed a lot of background documents. All of that activity led us to um, the work we did together uh, in April at the workshop, uh, reviewing a draft set of the strategic plan elements, which have been updated and reflected here today. This is the draft. Uh, vision statement, oopsie, that is not the vision, there we go, no, there we go, the draft, it's going to keep jumping, I think. All right, yeah, I will set my record down and we'll work in partnership, because we like partnership, right? That's a good thing. Uh, so the vision statement, a vibrant, healthy, and resilient community for all. Uh, we also had some discussion at the workshop about you know, some kind of energy or tagline that might accompany that. Um, beyond the, the vision statement itself, uh, in that discussion we talked about find your joy in Santa Cruz. And so we have used that as part of a branding piece um, as a part of your strategic plan to accompany that vision statement. All right, so on the next slide, we have uh, the seven focus areas, uh, those, those key buckets, those big rocks uh, that we talked about uh, when we were together. They reflect a number of different areas. We'll walk through them uh, each. Um, including the, the goal statements themselves and touch on the revisions that we have incorporated. So rather than walking through these individually, we'll just go right on in. The first one we have is financial sustainability and transparency. Uh, and on that next slide that shows the list of strategies, I'll highlight those areas where we made some modification uh, as the result of our workshop together. In that first bullet, that first strategy, we incorporated the idea of being creative, using different creative approaches uh, in the uh, identification of resources that really reflect the uniqueness of Santa Cruz. So that latter part of that statement there. So identifying creative and expanded revenue approaches um, was one area of modification. The others um, stand the same as when we worked together. The last of the strategies was added and that is to leverage grant funding and advocate for resources at the state and federal levels, recognizing the importance of those uh, resources and being in front of them. No other changes were incorporated to that set of strategies. The next focus area is strong business communities and a vibrant downtown. 
We did do an update to the goal statement itself. Uh, so it reads, cultivate a thriving downtown and local businesses citywide to support economic health and vitality. We really expanded that to incorporate local businesses citywide and also to infuse that element of vitality as a part of that statement. Within the strategies, we had several adjustments that we incorporated. In the second strategy, we wanted to make sure we emphasized youth and family friendly as a part of the downtown. That was a really important part of the conversation to infuse that into the, the plan and make sure that stood out as a priority. Um, so promote, a safe, promote downtown as a safe youth and family friendly center for commerce, housing, and transportation. We also, in the original version, had incorporated the downtown plan expansion, expansion as a part of that second strategy. But because it's such a big deal, we've heard about some of that today, uh, including the permanent arena for the Santa Cruz Warriors, we call that out as a separate, unique strategy contained within the plan. The second from the last of the strategies listed here was the last area where we made some modification. We wanted to really call out and specify those specific uh, business areas across the city that you want to prioritize. So grow events and cultural activities in the downtown or in other commercial areas to attract residents and visitors. For example, Midtown, Lower Seabright, Harvey West Industrial Area. So making sure that we're inclusive of those important areas uh, in that statement. We also, I should add, actually that was the third to the last. We changed or added the word to the last, second to last strategy to use the word activate. That was something that was really important to council to infuse that energy and bring life. That's part of the vitality that is stated in that goal statement. So we incorporated that word into that strategy. If we go to our next focus area, uh, it focuses on housing, which we know is a big area of interest. Uh, the goal statement to create and preserve housing for all with a focus on affordable and workforce housing is the same as it was when we were together. What we have added into the strategies is in the third from the last um, strategy, we incorporated the idea of leveraging partnerships and the importance to do so um, in that strategy. So leverage partnerships, government resources, and private funding to create affordable and transitional. That was also added uh, to be explicit in the strategy. Uh, housing projects in the community. The other strategies uh, remain the same that we worked together pre previously. If we turn to the next one, which is homeless, homelessness response, um, we saw the partnership and the importance of working with the county is really essential when we were together. So we updated the goal statement to lead with that. So it says, working with the county, move towards positive outcomes in the homelessness response, safety, and health balancing the interests of persons who are unhoused and housed with the business community. So really looking at that as a partnership. There were a number, number of strategies that we had some discussion around and made some modifications to. Uh, if we look down midway through, that begins with identify and leverage um, existing county resources. That was a new addition to the set of strategies um, to connect individuals and resources. Again, really leaning into that partnership with the county. The third from the bottom, we added the last part of the strategy to add specific focus on developing service delivery and accountability metrics, recognizing the importance of accountability and, and understanding how things are operating in the community. And lastly, we added the final of the strategies listed here, which is to advocate with the state and federal government for improved mental health and substance abuse disorder, or sub substance use disorder support, <laughs> easy for me to say. Um, in recognizing, again, the importance of advocacy on, in many of these critical need areas. In the second to last, I think, no, nope, third to last of the strategy areas, we have public safety and community well-being. Uh, no change to the goal statement, which reads to provide public safety services that support well-being and healthy communities. So a nice broad focus in the well-being of the community. Um, we have a number of strategies. The second one listed in there, uh, was modified, so we have evaluate and potentially establish an integrated health response team for the city. Uh, that reflects work that is um, envisioned and I believe underway. The last two strategies that are listed within this focus area seek community input to, find, to define an updated view of public safety was added and incorporated, reflecting the need to engage with the community but also to get clarity around what does that mean when we talk about public safety. 
uh, making sure that people are um, presented the opportunity to share what that looks like to them. And then lastly, to create opportunities for pro-social youth activities. Uh, and that was a discussion we had really in the spirit of trying to prevent, get ahead of homelessness and how to do that successfully with pro-social activities, programming, resources within the community. The next strategy, or next focus area rather, is the natural and built environment. Uh, we really wanted to focus on the combination of not just the built environment, but the natural beauty and the amenities that are available within the community uh, as an asset. So investing in sustainable, climate-adapted infrastructure and community assets is the goal there. For this one, we added the very first strategy there, uh, following the environmental scan and lots of conversation around the need to address deferred maintenance. So that stands out right up in front, address deferred maintenance and critical infrastructure. That includes water pipes, the wharf, streets, other major assets. The third strategy down, um, we've added in maintain and further develop a skilled and trained workforce. In recognition that you have an outstanding workforce already, it's not a matter of, um, of just of having to increase it, but actually to maintain and sustain and invest in that area. The strategy right below that, we added in the last part. So we have improved public transportation infrastructure to increase equitable access to sustainable travel options. Uh, that's mobility within the community. And then finally, the last strategy, we added in the idea of public partners, public-private partnership within um, identifying resources. So continue aggressively identifying and pursuing grant, public, private, and low interest loan financing programs, including becoming educated on how to best plan and structure projects to be grants eligible. So making sure you can seize those opportunities when they become available. And I'm happy to go back on any of these. I'm trying in the interest of time to hit the highlights. Uh, the last of the focus areas is the thriving organization. Uh, in order to get all of these things done, there's recognition as we discussed at our workshop that you need to have a thriving uh, organization. And so we spent a lot of time really emphasizing those, con those critical component components here. So advance a high-performing organization where employees, employees are empowered to deliver outstanding services to the community. That's the goal. In that first strategy uh, listed on, this, on the chart, I recognized that um, the draft document that we provided, we had added in, listened to. Uh, so it reads, foster a positive work culture where all employees are valued, included, listened to, and supported. Uh, so that's an error in the slide there. In your draft document, that was incorporated. Uh, we also added in the third to the bottom of the strategies to collaborate with regional, part, with regional agencies, including the um, community college and other school districts, um, and employers to develop a more direct workforce development and recruitment pipeline for the city. So recognizing that there are great resources out there and building those uh, partnerships and working together to support that. And lastly, we added the, the final strategy, which is to continuously improve and modernize city service delivery uh, and really embrace that spirit of continuous improvement uh, for the, the delivery of services and for public um, programming. So those are the changes that we have incorporated. Uh, happy to address any questions and I'm very interested to hear your feedback and your comments. You've know, had some time to percolate on this important work. Uh, and get your thoughts and comments. So our next steps, will obviously, we'll take your input today. Uh, and from that, we will be preparing a, a final version of your strategic plan. Um, and then from there, the, the implementation activities that will um, commence through your staff. So thank you for the opportunity to present this back to you. I'd like, like to hear, hear your comments. Thank you very much. Questions or comments by the council? The vice mayor is recognized. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed that day that we had together, and I appreciated how um, every, you synthesized everything that everybody kind of brought to the table, and everyone's different viewpoints are um, elevated here, and we can all work as a team moving forward. Just a couple of tiny details, um, and I don't know if it's just me, but the, the little find your joy in Santa Cruz, I don't know why I didn't like it, but I was just wondering, joy just seems like, it reminds me of like a Christmas song or something. <laughs> if, it, it's like a, it's kind of semantics, but if we could find something else, and I don't know if I'm the only one, maybe then maybe I, I'm overruled. I wonder, I wonder on that point. I think maybe more than one person might might comment on this. I, you know, in the Constitution, we're managing towards the pursuit of happiness. Mm. So I wonder if finding your happiness in Santa Cruz might be a little better. 
I like that. I like that. That's, that's that sounds nice. Um, and then the only other thing that I saw where I was like, hmm, I didn't see it anywhere, was in the homeless response. Was There's no mention, or in the public safety, about personal accountability. And I understand that um, homeless individuals are suffering and there's a lot going on, but I think in this town, there's been a lack of account of individual accountability. And um, it's frustrating. And I don't know if there's any place to add that, and maybe it's not, but that that first um, uh, vision statement at the top where it was like working with the interests, honestly, my interest is with the, 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 contri the other members of the community, the business, the housed, mm -hmm. and I'd like to see if, because when we're offering shelter and they're not accepting it, then what? Because that's what my experience has been. And I hate to like beat a dead horse here, but I just got back from a third world country and guess what we didn't see on the ground? Any garbage or, and I didn't see any homeless people wandering the streets and we went to three different cities. And so we can do it too. We can do it. Thank you, Madam Vice Mayor. Thank you. We will work our way around, Ms. Bruner. Thank you. Um, um, I'll start where you kind of left off on the <laughs> joy. And I was just pulling up my notes because I remember that um, there was a, a, a discussion around several options. Um, and I think it was really trying to incorporate um, you know, create a sustainable, livable city that brings joy, a vibrant, healthy, resilient community, find your joy. We kind of played around with all those um, topics, uh, building a future for everyone together, a thriving community, equity, wellness, health, sustainability. And, and so um, it's funny that we're revisiting it and it stands out in a different way now because I feel like that's what we landed on. Um, but I, you know, for me, it's either way, they all incorporate, I think, what our vision and our goals are. Um, my input um, for this is um, I really, we, we touched on it in that, um, that uh, retreat in the workshop, um, seniors and the, nat the natural environment um, are two places, two, two topics that I'm not really seeing called out in, in here and whether it's in housing, community well-being. Um, I think, you know, as we recently have um, worked towards being an AA RP designated city, and um, so the senior component, and our um, uh, priority of our natural environment and investing in our parks and um, amenities and open spaces. I think, um, you know, it, it. And I remember that that was all around what it means to be a livable city. What that, you know, as we define, there was trying to define livable city and defining public safety. There were some discussions I remember around those two points. And so I just think there's a way to really incorporate that in here um, a little more. Okay. Well, I'm gonna, if I could, my, on the, under the natural infrastructure, we'd added in the word natural, but what I'm hearing is where's the strategy that... The environment yeah. and the, yeah. Okay less so the infrastructure, I mean, not less so, like infrastructure and the natural environment. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Let's call up Tari Johnson. Thank you. Um, you weren't alone. I also, the tagline didn't resonate with me either. <laughs> I just kind of was like, uh, rang a little cheesy. And I know we talked about it. I looked at my notes too. But then when I saw it, it didn't, um, didn't land with me. I like the mayor's suggestion better than what we have here. Um, but other than that, I thought this that you thank you for integrating the feedback that you received on that retreat day and from all the various ways that you've been getting information from the community. I explicitly wanted to call out the integration of youth and families into many of the strategies. So I really liked seeing that. Um, I do recall talking about our health and all policies as uh, the prism in which we look out um, 
for every strategy that we have, and so that was a very big missing okay. um, in this report for me. Um, and even if it's uh, a, at the beginning when we have our vision statement with a visual that shows that this is all within the framework of health equity and sustainability, I don't know what it looks like, and um, my colleague, Councilmember Watkins, may have some other suggestions. Um, and then, you know, just the other thing uh, I shared with our city manager, it's a lot of different strategy areas or focus areas. Mm -hmm. And I kept wrecking my brain of how we could consolidate, but I think, I think we would lose something. So just having worked on strategic plans before and knowing that you typically want to keep it to like three to five areas, and we've got how many? Seven. <laughs> Seven. <laughs> It's a lot. I, I don't know how we solve for that. I, I couldn't figure it out. Each of these areas is really important. The strategies listed are important. It's very thorough. So I don't know, but it's a lot. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Let me move this way. Council Member Watkins is recognized. Okay. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much for your work. It's really nice to see the edit, the edited version and incorporation of all of our thoughts and comments, so I really appreciate that. Um, I, I agree with the suggestions in terms of the joy. I think, you know, it, it, it can come off that way. I like happiness. I think that feels good. So as we look at revisiting that, that makes sense to me. Um, I'll just share because I was thinking of my daughter when I said all of her like have fun and like I told her that and she's like and mom like Black Lives Matter we need more rights for women <laughs> <laughs> so she wanted to have fun and all the other things that we're doing so I just wanted to contextualize that she's like don't miss you know, the, the passion sure it's the passion part exactly exactly but it's all about really how you feel here in our community right and so how do we capture that and how do we implement strategies that reflect that um, I do agree with the health and all policies. It could be as uh, simple as a, a visual. There's one in Richmond that is like a prism and you can, it basically shows like decision making and then it comes out through the prism of these lenses of health equity and sustainability. So just as we, you know, integrate that, that's one suggestion we could do just visually keeping it um, kind of shorter, on, uh, which I really like. Um, so yes, about the health and all policies, I agree about the age friendly cities um, and our climate change strategies for sure. And then um, I'm, I'm assuming, but I think to your point, Council Member um, Kalantari Johnson, like how is this not a strategic plan that goes on a wall, but ultimately like an adaptability plan that we're using to guide us and to prioritize as years to come, right? And so as we're thinking about revisiting this, this plan, you know, what is built into how we revisit it would be of interest to me. And so not losing track of the work, but also tying it to the priorities and the implementation strategies and checkpoints along the way. Um, but other than that, I think it's, I think it's really great. I really like that it's, I think less is more in terms of wordy, it's not very wordy, which I appreciate. Um, and yeah, I really appreciate your, your time and energy and effort to make it reflect what we said. So thank you and thanks for being here. Other council members on this? Ms. Brown? I, I, would, I would just add, um, or, or sort of uh, associate myself, as the mayor says, with the comments <laughs> made uh, by my colleagues uh, around the kind of some of the specifics with respect to age friendly cities, kind of how we are looking across the age spectrum, children and youth, to make that more prominent. Um, and you know, I, I have a hard time engaging with documents like this. It's just the, not the way my brain works. I'm like, I'm a nuts and bolts person. So, um, you know, there's a, there's a lot here. And um, I think that uh, Council Member Kalantari Johnson's point about, you know, how is it that we're going to put this into action? That's a question for all of us for the future as well as just a comment here for the document. Uh, so thank you. And uh, pass it off to my colleague. You, you, no pressure. <laughs> Mr. Newsom, without uh, th pressure. No, thank you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Mayor Keeley. And my, my comments will be uh, brief. Just want to thank you for, for all your work on this document and for incorporating all of our, um, uh, for all of the uh, feedback that you received on the document. And I do want to associate with the comments about the, uh, as well, refine your happiness to Santa Cruz. I, I like that suggestion as well. So thank you. For the comments? We can go through a few items. I'm, uh, yeah. The last one that stands between us and our summer vacation, as I understand. <laughs> it, so. Yeah, yikes. Um, let's start with uh, the page that has uh, the handsome city manager on it. Um, 
<laughs> uh, on that, uh, a message from the mayor, if you'd be kind enough to have that be a mayor from a message from the mayor and city council, if you would agree on the last sentence to change that to, we look forward to working with you. That'd be helpful. Thank you. If we go over to let's go over to homeless response for a moment. Uh, two items there. I imagine everything in this report is fair game. <laughs> okay, good enough. Uh, some will be obviously more important than others. Uh, I wonder if in response to the vice mayor's question on homelessness response, if we might add a bullet that read something like this. Support efforts that increase personal responsibility as an outcome, excuse me, as an element of program outcomes. I'll read it again. Support efforts that increase personal responsibility as an element of program outcomes. Get you where you want to go? Okay, something like that, perhaps, without objection. Uh, also, the photo on that page uh, may actually be something more suitable for natural and built environment. Uh, I think there ought to be an honest photo there. Uh, and by honest, I mean what we're doing in that regard. Something 1220 River Street, Housing Matters, something that goes to homelessness, which I don't think this does. And I might just a note on the con, the, the photos. Some of them we are interested in having higher quality. We needed to do some placeholders, and so noted. Good Thank enough. Uh, in that same vein, on the next page, on public safety and community well-being, uh, I think, again, I'm not sure this photo matches up to that as much as one of the most significant things that's ever happened in this community on this issue, uh, which took place again last weekend, which is the repainting of the BLM uh, uh, mural out in front of City Hall, might be an appropriate photo here. Uh, uh, staying in this vein on thriving organization. Um, although I know these are pictures of the county uh, vehicle fleet. Um, <coughs> I, some of which are getting a little long in the tooth. Uh, but I wonder if instead some people photo of our wonderful city staff folks in some kind of setting that, that brings recognition to them rather than a special event that that is run by the Parks Department. Um, that would be my feedback. Let me ask if there are other comments. Uh, uh, Council Member Watkins. No, I appreciate you um, raising the, the comment and the point about adding some language there and then tying it, you know, in terms of a, com a comment around the picture for the Black Lives Matter. Because I think what happens when we have discussions about accountability, it automatically feels like criminalization or penalty. Mm -hmm. And really what, for example, the Black Lives Matter conversation was about accountability as a part of healing, as part of mm -hmm. personal responsibility, mm -hmm. and as part of growth as a community and acknowledgement of truth and, and reconciliation in that way. So I don't know how we capture the nuances of what that means, because I think it is part of how are individuals um, able to learn from mistakes or cir circumstances, situations supported, um, healed as a community, and supported to be successful independently and that's part of our court system, our, our uh, county system, our programs, our, our system, our police system. I mean, it's so integrated. Um, so I, I guess I, I say that because I feel like the nexus between the experience that happened with the Black Lives Matter is a really great um, example of what a restorative justice accountability approach could be to what ultimately I think you're getting out, uh, Vice Mayor, with your concern around how that can be an opportunity for an individual to grow and to thrive and become um, healed as a community, our community healed from any um, experiences and then an ability for hopefully thriving, right, and, mm -hmm. and ultimately actualizing our vision. So I, I guess as we think about the nuances of the language with that particular bullet, I don't know how we can capture that you know, succinctly, mm -hmm. um, but I think it's really important as a value and as a approach to a really complex issue that I know we all um, face and can sometimes be overgeneralized in one direction or another. Mm -hmm. So those are my two cents mm -hmm. on that. Thank you. Further comment? Further comment? Uh, the 
action on this was to do what we just did, provide you with feedback. I don't believe there is an official action which needs to be taken unofficially. Thank you very, very much. Long process. It's my pleasure. Process. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Enjoy your summer break. Yes, thank you. <laughs> thank you. some public comment. Yes, yeah. Oh. <laughs> We're good. Um, so, Mr. Geiger, good afternoon. Sorry, uh, not so fast, folks, but I did run under on my last comment. Uh, I'm here to represent uh, people on this petition. I'm going to submit to the clerk uh, about 80 people from uh, Delaware. I'm sorry, we're on public comment? No, I'm sorry. We're, I thought I, you heard you mention public right, comment. Mr. Geiger. Let, me, let me clarify I just can't control myself. <laughs> not a problem. I, you do a pretty good job of that, though. Um, I, I want to see if there's any, any, any further comment on the strategic plan. Anything? Anybody? Sure, please. Good afternoon again. Yes, good afternoon again, Gillian Greensite. Um, I'm not usually a fan of strategic plans. However, there's some good things in here, and I'd just like to in, uh, highlight a couple. I really, is the word associate myself mm. with uh, <laughs> Council Member Bruner's uh, uh, focus on open space? I think that really needs uh, more focus um, and the natural environment. Um, on behalf of so many people in the community, uh, could we get rid of the term Midtown? I call it the East Side. It really grates for a lot of us. Uh, so I would uh, very much uh, like to, that to happen. I was really happy to see that... Um, in, I couldn't get it all. It's very hard to see, actually, the PowerPoint from the public's point of view. Uh, but it was ensure that development is adequately balanced with other things. That, I'm just looking at time, that is often completely absent when we're talking about development, new housing and growth. I mean, if you're trying to get an appointment with your dermatologist and you can't get one, you've got to go over the hill. All of those sorts of little personal things are tied with our expanding community where we're bringing people in, but we don't have the adequate resources. People focus on water, etc. rightfully so, I guess, but it's the other thing. So I hope you will take that to heart as you talk about development or approved developments. Um, I thought that was a great idea to reach out to the colleges to recruit workers for the city. Fabulous idea. So, where's time? Oh, it's there also. I've been doing that all day. Um, Take your time. You're fine. You're fine. Thank you. Uh, under public safety and community well-being, um, that was the area that I was disappointed in. Um, there are, I think, eight bullet points and two that I wrote down. One is um, establish or potentially establish an integrated health response team for the city. That might be okay. The other one was determine the feasibility and funding of a regional public safety training centre. I'm not quarrelling with those, but <coughs> what struck me, especially after my focus really and what I shared with you was my concern about rape and domestic violence in our city and the ordinance that requires addressing that to be one of our highest priorities, that that doesn't rate a mention under that category of public safety and community well-being. So I'd ask if you could support having a statement in there that acknowledges that focus and addresses it. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Any other comments? Anybody online? Uh, person online? Good afternoon. Yeah, hi. This is Garrett again. Hey, uh, my earliest remembrances of five-year plans were the communists who seem to have a five-year plan every two years. But seriously, it is good to have a five-year plan, but I don't really see that this is that. It is mostly very vague at times, a manifesto of beliefs, nice-sounding general ideas, ideologies, you know, uh, many of the uh, which are the socialist variety. Actual five-year plans have objective, quantifiable objectives, such as reduce crime and potholes by 20% or complete the CIP this or that and such. Little here is measurable, like none of it. Uh, not surprisingly, the first plan strategy mentioned is about getting your hands on more money, a lot more money, i.e. identifying creative, expanded revenue approaches, money, 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 without limit. 
a vague smorgasbord of whatever you might do that comes later, including support housing production for permanent supportive housing and low, very low, extremely low housing, which sounds like maximizing, I'd say, a vague, out of your scope, socially subsidized welfare government housing plan and a deepening of the cesspool of government dependence here locally. Welfare is not a simple matter, uh, nor the city's function. As far as I very reluctantly go is buying a very limited specific amount of land, preferably surplus government land, and putting it into a permanent affordable housing trust to incentivize low-cost housing bills. Beyond that, it's just a huge no. It's too socialist and caters to and invites poverty as it does. I would also mention this BLM billboard has caused nothing but grief for two years, and the lesson there is it was a mistake. I could go through virtually almost every directive here and not be able to say what specifically or exactly these word salads mean. But provide services to people at risk of eviction to prevent homelessness. Seek community input to better define updated view of public safety. Identify priorities need capital investments to support climate adaptation. Uh, you know, the idea that current climate change goals will produce a rational, quantifiable betterment of the human condition is not an unquestionable fact, and it needs a real slow go. Sweden just announced today they are abandoning renewable energy and they will go full nuclear. Again, these are all easily hijackable issues like COVID, like many things. Uh, drive diversity, equity, inclusion efforts to strengthen sense of belonging. Uh, you know, it, it can, um, in other words, foster diversity and inclusion discrimination and trash merit to make people's lives somehow more equal despite the fact that they are undeniably just different and have responsibility for their own lives. Again, it's an easily and dangerously hijacked leftist mantra. I missed the part where you ever figure out the right size and purpose for government, state the limits of what the government should or shouldn't do, and including not do, uh, all in a sustainable way instead of this ever <laughs> Thank you, sir. Good afternoon. Hi, uh, 30, 31, that was, that's the uh, uh, strategic plan. I just want to talk a little bit about, um, you know, integrative um, uh, strategies for, uh, um, uh, let's see, harm reduction to uh, the natural environment, um, whether within or, or surrounding the city and greenbelt, um, parks, um, developments. Um, but I, I was really surprised, you know, like, uh, I was really surprised to see a coyote in uh, Sky Park up in Scottsdale. I was like, wow, this is, this is, this is really, uh, this is really earth shattering seeing a, a coyote running through Sky Park. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, maybe I just wasn't there when the, the coyote was around, uh, but, um, uh, there, you know, like, uh, yeah, in terms of, in terms of the, uh, variety of, uh, wildlife in the city and the, in the, um, the great, you know, natural beauty that our county has. Um, you know, we have to realize that, you know, every, every, you know, tourist who dumps uh, the diapers and the fast food um, uh, trash on, on the, you know, on, on the off the curb on the, you know, just conveniently right out of their door, um, that's something that, in one way or another, ends up, you know, potentially affecting the balance of the natural uh, life here, in our, um, in our, in our city, in our county. Uh, so I, I do, uh, not unlike uh, uh, Ms. Ms. Bruner, who I um, commend for her efforts, I, I do a lot of um, cleanup, just, you know, I get my hands dirty, I wash my hands a lot, but I get my hands dirty, I pick up a lot of stuff, I see it. Uh, I know I've talked a number of times about Ocean Street and how I feel Ocean Street uh, could be improved. It is sort of a keystone kind of a place, it's a, a spot. Um, and you know, because it's the it's the thing people see when they come here, and then they get an idea of like, well, that's how Santa Cruz is. So, uh, I uh, let's see. I just wanted to say I'm a I'm a big fan of public transit. I'm a super client of public transit, and uh, I like the uh, the the shuttle. Uh, it just stops at too few places, if you ask me. That thing could go all over. It could serve all these intersections in the city, different places, county building, ocean water. Uh, could go up to Bay and Laurel, uh, Mission Street, Safeway. Could go over to uh, Morrissey and Soquel, uh, Soquel and, and Ocean. You just go in a number of places in a in a kind of not too circuitous a circuit, but like a circuit that serves a lot of the community and the people. It's just a dollar, and it's a smaller bus. It's manageable. You know, it's a it's just for people. You know, 
people's convenience. So no matter what level they're on, I like it a lot. I like it a lot. I think it could be really expanded upon. Um, and what else? I don't, I don't even know what I'm doing here talking. Okay, thanks. Bye. Hey, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Anyone else online? Next person online, good afternoon. Hi, it's Reggie Meisler again from Santa Cruz Cares. Um, so I was uh, supposed to get five minutes for this item. Um, so yeah, let me just quickly talk about um, the public safety slide, uh, the bullet point, determine feasibility and funding for a regional public safety center. Staff uh, kind of skipped over this one, but uh, this is kind of a big deal. Um, you know, I don't know if you guys know about the Atlanta uh, forests, Wilani Forest, uh, where they're doing a cop city, as it's called, um, a domestic urban warfare uh, training center for police. And given uh, the proximity to the Santa Cruz mountain forests, uh, it feels like this is uh, an attempt to do something similar here. We will not accept that kind of project in our backyard. Policing and prisons do not prevent crime or increase public safety. Our modern police are rooted in slave patrols and union busting. We've been through the George Floyd movement. You should all know this by now. Their purpose is to maintain racial and class hierarchies because that was their root. It is not to ensure public safety. That's why they can't be bothered to look at rape kits. That's why uh, they're constantly coordinating with anti-houseless neighborhood groups to selectively ticket uh, poor people in vehicles. That's why when we told SCPD that they shouldn't ticket people based on illegal overnight parking signs in the coast, Chief Escalante told Lookout Santa Cruz if there's a parking sign, we enforce it. And then it required us to go to the Coastal Commission to stop them from doing that. That's why when Tamario Smith died in our main jail, leading community members to ask for an oversight committee, Sheriff Hart resisted that demand. This is not good faith. This is not a training problem. This is not something that you resolve through communication. This is a structural problem because of what police and prisons were originally designed to do and therefore what they continue to be designed to do. The safest communities are the most well-resourced with housing, healthcare, and education. They are not the most well-policed and those with the most resources for policing and imprisonment. So we appreciate the bullet point uh, in the public safety slide that says seek community input on an updated view of public safety because that's what needs to happen here. We cannot keep moving forward with this frankly anti-black, anti-homeless, uh, anti-poor perspective of public safety which upholds and invests more and more resources into structures that were originally intended to segregate the poor people of color and uh, step on unions and break their backs. The George Floyd movement was not about that. You know that, like you, you've been around, right? Like Minneapolis tried to pass an abolish police amendment. That was like, uh, that was something they tried to do. The Black Visions Collective, they burned down a police station, right? Like, you know that happened. They didn't, like, we, although we kneeled with our police, that was not what they were asking for. They tried all the different reforms. They have the Black Femme-led intellectual tradition of abolition and uh, also rooted in um, W.E.B. Du Bois. So it's like, this. the information is there, guys. Like. This is to, to try to keep moving down this path of just deep, deep harm. Pretend like this is going to keep working for you. It's not. I mean, I'm. we're going to organize to stop any cop city you try to build here. And we're going to organize to move forward an actual racial justice movement. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else who's with us in chambers? Anyone else online? 
Next person online, good afternoon. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, hi, my name is Jasmine Mia. Um, I appreciate that there was a planning process overview in the strategic plan, and I noticed places where I wish to see more transparency. For example, under council interviews, who was interviewed? The community survey only yielded 275 responses, which seems nowhere near reflective of the people's opinion. It said the survey was made available on the city's social media channels. Not everyone follows the city, so you already have a selection bias there. Not everyone even has or can access social media, so you have an accessibility issue there. I'd like to see more voices included in the feedback. Next, I was shocked to see a line item under public safety and community well-being that says, quote, determine feasibility and funding of a regional public safety training center. That sounds like what Atlantans are calling Cop City, and Reggie addressed this in his comment. The people of Atlanta do not want Cop City, and I doubt Santa Cruzans do either. I know I don't. These training centers are often used to teach military strategies and uh, truly seem aimed at quelling the masses when we exercise our right to protest. It can even produce more violent tactics that get turned against our own citizens, especially black and brown ones like me. Um, and as a personal note, I feel very unsafe around police um, and I'm physically traumatized almost all the time when I see them. It scares me that you slipped in such a contentious line item. How many people are actually reading everything in the proposed strategic plan? And how many people have shown up time and time again to ask you to defund police? We don't need a training center. You can't train your way out of a systemic imbalance of power that stands to uphold interests of the capitalist class. Please use any money that would go to this training center to instead fund more social services like housing and mental health, which would help meet people's basic needs, thereby preventing many crimes. I'm pretty confident that social services will increase public safety more than a regional public safety training center. All this being said, I'm highly offended about the idea of using a photo of the Black Lives Matter mural as a photo for public safety, since the fight for safety for BIPOCs needs to be an abolitionist one, following in the work of Angela Davis, Mariam Kaba, Ruth Wilson Gilmore, and more. Also, public safety is so synonymous with law enforcement. Lastly, I agree with some of the comments that these goals are very vague, and it seems like it will be hard to measure if or when they are met. In fact, they do seem so all-encompassing, I don't see how they can be accomplished within five years, if at all. I would love to be part of further conversations on how to break these down into SMART goals, specific, measurable, achievable, reliable, and time-bound. Additionally, I agree with Jillian that public safety and community well-being should include some commitment to the prevention of violence against women, especially after the presentation today. Thank you for listening to my feedback. Thank you very much. Anyone else, Ms. Bush? Next person online, good afternoon. Hello, this is Joy Shendel Decker, also of Santa Cruz Cares. I support everything that Reggie made in his comment to you, um, as well as what Jazz just commented. Um, I would like to point out that the comments about personal responsibility are unhoused on our streets and in our shelters. Those comments are profoundly ableist and don't recognize that substance related and addiction disorders are recognized in the DSM-5. These are disorders, they're chronic illnesses and they are treatable. We have medically assisted treatment or medication assisted treatment and, and uh, safe injection sites. We have harm reduction. These are evidence-based, research-backed, widely accepted and effective ways of helping people who have addiction-related disorders. And personal responsibility and accountability in the way that I think you're talking about it, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't think comes into account very much in this. Um, we need to provide people with a social safety net and programs, which we know are absolutely minimal in our county and in our city. We do not have the treatment 
available for the people that I have had heard comments echoed about here today that people need to be personally um, responsible. We do not have the treatment available for them. We do not have the housing available for them. And everybody on this city council, including Mayor Keeley and everybody else except for C Council Member Brown, voted to send an amicus brief in support of the lawsuit against the Harm Reduction Coalition recently. Vice Mayor Golder is part of that lawsuit. The CEQA part was thrown out and now it's going forward as a public nuisance lawsuit. This is like totally unacceptable when you wrap it all together. So thank you for listening. I appreciate it. I would really appreciate being part of these kinds of conversations and stakeholder groups. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else online? Let's go to the next person. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, person online. Good afternoon, council. Yes, hi. This is Judy Grunstra, and uh, I've got a quite a simple observation about this, uh, what is lacking in this plan. Uh, I also have been reading some strategic plans lately by the Parks and Rec Commission, uh, Parks and Rec Department, and the library. Everybody's coming out with these strategic plans that are vague. And um, one thing that I think is quite a simple recognized need are public restrooms. I don't see anything about that in the Parks and Rec strategic plan or uh, this under, you would think it would be under public safety and community well-being, but it's been talked about a lot, like how come we don't have you know, enough public restrooms? And I'd like to see that addressed somewhere. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else online, Ms. Bush? <clears throat> Excuse me. No? All right. Anyone else wish to testify? Matters back before the council. There is no recommended action except to hold this, uh, this discussion this afternoon. We are on oral communication. This would be the opportunity for anyone to address the city on a matter under our jurisdiction, but not on today's agenda. And good afternoon, Mr. Geiger. <laughs> Afternoon. Let me try that again. We, okay. uh, I've got some petitions here. Uh, these are people in the Delaware, Elmar, um, Woodrow area. Uh, about 80 signatures, about 95% of the people approached signed this. Uh, this is in regard to the traffic diversion due to the West Cliff Drive uh, unfortunateness. <laughs> so um, naturally everybody wants less cars on the street, except perhaps auto mechanics, but there are none here. <laughs> Not here today, so they're not represented. Um, Oxford Way uh, had 600 cars a day, I believe was a study, and it went up to 2,000. And somehow that was deemed extremely un unacceptable by somebody somewhere in the bureaucracy because now they have barricades stopping cars from going through. Uh, I think most of us would agree the intelligent way to approach a problem is to gather data analyze the data and formulate some kind of a policy and at least see if it works. I don't believe that was done in this case. Uh, as soon as Westcliff was closed, there was immediately detour signs sending people up to Delaware Avenue. Um, how, how come? Well, I've heard that it's, well, uh, it's an arterial. Well, arterials are main streets, yes, but to get people from somewhat distant points, this detour is like how you look at it, either three short blocks or one long block. I think an arterial is irrelevant to the fact that the detour was sent up there. Uh, this plan, if it was a plan, is in violation of the uh, city's climate action plan. It's causing unnecessary driving three blocks up, three blocks back, thousands of cars a day. You're talking about some serious mileage by the end of the year. But that's not the main problem here. The problem is actually a matter of life and death. If you're familiar with Delaware Avenue, you'll think about where the divided part going west ends and then you have to swerve over in front of council member Golder's sister's house. And I believe they've lost three cars totaled in the last five years, the neighbors next to them, blah, blah, blah. That, that's bad, that's really bad. But what's even worse is the bicycle lane disappears at that point, it disappears. And people now are into the traffic and 
putting more traffic onto Delaware Avenue is increasing this hazard. There's no reason to put more traffic on Delaware Avenue. This is where kids ride their bikes to school. They don't ride down the other streets because it's not arterial. It would make more sense to put the traffic from Westcliff on the closest streets to Westcliff. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Geiger. Let me see if anyone else wishes to comment on oral communication. Is there anyone online, uh, Ms. Bush? Nobody with their hand raised. Okay, very good. And the clerk will be glad to accept those. Thank you, Mr. Geiger. Good afternoon, sir. Um, let's see. Uh, let's see. Yeah, I just want to touch again on my, I mean, my thoughts on um, a circulator in Santa Cruz as opposed to, you know, um, you know, solely one that they have in, in, in Watsonville, which is uh, from every indication the people I've talked to is really highly um, utilized. It's, it's a very, it's kind of a favorite of the community there in Watsonville. Um, one thing I've, uh, I've noted from um, going up to campus a lot is that a lot of people don't, you know, get off very often at the base of campus, but they, they do, they do quite a few. But if there were a bus, some kind of bus that went just to the base of campus, it would really facilitate that huge issue that students have about like there not being enough buses. Um, because, you know, it just takes pressure off those those buses that they, they do have. <clears throat> um, it's just a thought on that. Um, but, um, yeah, uh, getting to the boardwalk itself, I guess one thing, I guess, I, I mean, I guess, I can kind of see why, excuse me, I'm eating some almonds. Um, I guess I can see uh, why they don't, don't go up Beach Street to the boardwalk itself, like per se, get to the boardwalk. Um, but, you know, I kind of feel like the circulator could, could um, as such, you know, it's administrated by her, her professional um, administrative capacities. Um, it could probably serve I think, if, I mean, it would be nice if it served a few more stops. I mean, I've talked to your drivers about that, and they think they agree, I think, um, or not, you know, seem to. Um, uh, five minutes. Uh, have a great, <coughs> have a great summer. <coughs> Anyone else online, Ms. Bush? No. Anyone else who's with us? Good afternoon. Good afternoon, at the risk of really being standing between you and vacation. I thought okay. since I'm still okay. here and it's oral communications, I'd share something which um, you know, I've shared in other places, but not here. And it is, first my of all... My guess is nobody has a plane at uh, like <laughs> 5 o'clock. Yeah, so take your time, you're good. Thank you. Um, I'd, I'd like to echo the appreciation for the public work staff for moving ahead to fixing the damage on Westcliff. What has disturbed me is that that has not been the central thrust of all of this. Uh, you know, th that should be the story. It was damaged from a storm. The storms are not um, precedented. Uh, the engineers said that the parts that really were damaged were because they were from the 90s and they weren't fixed. They didn't have maintenance. The parts that were recent, um, riprap, stood up well. So the, the end of that story is, well, we get federal money to fix this and fix it so we can withstand further storms. But then there's a sideshow, and the sideshow is people who want to turn Westcliff one way, I'm not one of them, and there are a lot like me who don't want that, and that has seemed to have captured a lot of city uh, staff's attention and um, consultants and public meetings, and that disturbs me because it feels like it is not the central issue. And it was sort of almost symbolically um, indicated at those public meetings in London Nelson Centre when the public work staff was sort of at the back corner and the other presenters with their big bold ideas for 100 years in the future had sent a stage and lots of, um, um, you know, bling to, to share. So 
I just hope we will be honest about this and keep centred on what is needed. The road will be opened up for two-way and then the situations that Mr Geiger mentioned will go away. So I'm hoping that will be in our future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. We do. We're going to do, we're going to do, you'll be right up after this. Somebody did call in, so we'll toggle back and forth. So good afternoon, person online. Welcome. Okay, this is Garrett again. Hey, this so-called workforce affordable housing should transparently be called for what it is. Government price controlled subsidized welfare housing or public project housing. Consider the end game where more and more parcels are subsidized and more gain welfare exempt property tax status. Fewer and fewer people remain to be coercively forced to subsidize and more and more subsidized tenants neither pay for all their housing nor for the city services they consume. It burns the economic candle at both ends. Under what socioeconomic theory is an ever increasing welfare state a viable indicator the city is headed in the right direction? It is defective equity or Bernie socialism or anarchy to rich because what it is not is free market capitalism without monopolies. You suggest we gleefully gush over expensive city software showing us the constantly growing parcels of price control subsidized welfare housing instead of seeing it as spreading economic decay and the deepening cesspool of government dependence. Big surprise, I've not received my email invitation to any further public meeting of the Welfare Housing Initiative. That's okay, it was a poser convention all around. I've wondered if someone like in Ocean's Eleven would get the empty home tax gang back together for one more caper, or how many people who don't live here or will pay is involved. So far, who they are is a mystery. Last meeting, the socialists were out in force regurgitating the immoral real estate transfer tax. I assume they drool while contemplating its direct theft nature, hijacking the valid purpose of a tax intended to cover actual minor documentary costs, knowing very well it will never apply to them. The very few cities that do this are cities with rising crime in moral and economic decline in the East Bay and San Francisco. We'll all have just ranked San Francisco dead last in the nation as to how well run a big city is. Let's not... Thank you, sir. Good afternoon. Mayor and Council, uh, my name is Grant Wilson. I guess I've been coming sporadically to City Council meetings since I moved here in the 1980s. Um, and I feel a bit of frustration about the structure and process uh, because I've, well, I've come, I've tried to come to speak at oral communications, I think, maybe two other times in the past two or three months, but I would find that well, it's, it's actually unclear when oral communications happens. And to me, it's very frustrating because I think at least maybe for 20 years or more, it was always at 7 p.m. at the start of the meeting. That, to me, seems good because it allows working families, working people who have jobs to be able to get home from work and be able to come and speak. And I know sometimes it's frustrating. Sometimes you don't hear pleasant things by the, from the public. But that's the democratic process. That's the process of representing the community. You have to hear people who don't agree with you or don't like you or whatever. But I think by putting oral communications at an arbitrary time, I mean, I called the, you know, the city council office today to ask, well, what time does it happen? Well, they certainly couldn't tell me. I don't think any of you could tell me. It's just when the other agenda items are done. And that's, to me, that's just not very democratic. That's not very transparent. That's not, uh, that doesn't allow people to come and speak. And I feel like that's evading your responsibilities as elected representatives. So that I would uh, implore you and encourage you to shift it back to a time where the public could actually speak and could plan on speaking. So thank you. Welcome. Stay here for just a second. Uh, customarily, we don't respond, but I, I would just I know provide that. an informational piece for you. Earlier in our agenda today on item nine, there were a whole series of sort of technical issues and so on, some of which were moderately substantive. And the council on the issue, that exactly the issue you're raising, pulled that item, gave direction to the city manager and to me to meet and look exactly at this issue about when does oral communication happen Good. for the reasons thank you. you're talking about. So thank, thank, thank you, you, for, thank you. For, for bringing that to our attention also. 
Let me ask if there is uh, anyone else online. Nobody anyone there. else? Anyone else with us? And was there a? Certainly, Ms. Bruner. Okay. Um, a question on um, um, the de the whole detour sign um, uh, item that was brought up in oral communications, and I understand Public Works has been working on that, and there are updates to that. Um, can someone tell me at the, in city staff where that information, where the public can find that information um, for the most recent updates with detours and the whole, um, you know, uh, Oxford, cul-de-sac, Pelton, Woodrow, Almar, Delaware, Alta, Pelton, Delaware, and all of those signage? Because we've we've all received a lot of concerns regarding those impacts and and. Well, I understand it is temporary as they're working through that. Um, I think it would be good to just publicly say where those in, that updated information can be found for folks. I can answer that. <laughs> There's all, so I just because I get Mayor. I get emails and phone calls daily. I think maybe more than any of us because of where my district is. There's a website and um, it's on the city of Santa Cruz. Website and, there, and the title of the, the page is Westcliff Storm Damage and Temporary Traffic Controls. And there's a bunch of links on there where you can find up to date information. And Claire and Matt have been really responsive to the neighbors, going out and meeting with neighbors and responding to their emails and questions as they come up. And so, you know, I've been really impressed with their professionalism and the level of um, customer service that they're giving to those neighbors. And it hasn't solved all the problems. And so, we have a meeting scheduled after the 4th of July where we're meeting up with um, city staff again and um, kind of figuring out next steps and circling back with neighbors after um, mid-July probably. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Further business to come before the council? Ms. Bush, further action we need to take? Mr. City Attorney? Someone's Madam hand did go up. If all good here? Excuse I'm sorry. One more hand just went up if you want to. Oh, yeah. online? Okay, we'll, we'll take one more. One more. Good afternoon. Person online, good afternoon. Yes, good afternoon. I'm going to give you three more. One, two, three. Sorry about that. Uh, whoever was online, uh, we'll, we'll talk to you in August, I suspect. Uh, <laughs> All business having finished, I'll just uh, use the the prerogative of the presiding officer just to say this is, uh, ends up my first six or seven months on this council, and I want to thank uh, colleagues for your kindness and thoughtful approach to your civic responsibilities here as elected officials. To Ms. Bush, who even with uh, diminished number of staff people here performed heroically again today. So thanks to you and your wonderful staff in the city clerk's office, city manager, city attorney, all the staff of the city of Santa Cruz. Uh, thank you so much for the first half of uh, this year being one of uh, a lot of hard work and a lot of uh, uh, progress in various areas. And thank you all very much. We all, I believe, wish everyone here uh, a happy uh, summer vacation for a while. And we'll see you again at the beginning of, uh, of August. A motion to adjourn would be in order. The vice mayor moves. Every member of the city council seconds, but we will designate Mr. Newsom as the official second on that. Non-debatable. Those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries and so ordered. Happy summer. Thank you.